I swear by Almighty God that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles, his heirs and successors, according to law. So help me God. for Romford wishes to take the oath to the king and Rosner. I swear by Almighty God that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles his heirs and successors according to law, so help me God. Right, we now start with questions to Secretary of State for Defence. Alan Smith. Number one, sir. Here, here. Good afternoon, Mr Speaker. The Department's priority is to finalise entry into the PESCO military mobility project before considering involvement in other projects. However, we assess that the EU standard third country terms for PESCO, PESCO projects involving procurement or capability development will continue to impose a significant constraint on UK involvement. Alan Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm grateful for the answer. Uh, I, I appreciate that the UK Government's attitude to PESCO is to take each project on a case-by-case -case basis, but could I suggest that publishing some criteria about what that case-by-case -case basis assessment is based upon would be really useful, because it's obvious to the dogs in the street that PESCO is going to evolve at light speed, and the UK risks missing out on a lot of really important cooperation that could be really beneficial. So could the Minister publish that guidance, uh, otherwise I'll be putting down 68 parliamentary questions to cover each of the 68 uh, mechanisms that PESCO has. Hear, hear. Well, Mr Speaker, I, I note the Honourable Gentleman's suggestion and I fear that my answer will give him encouragement to table the 68 questions, um, because I think it is right that we consider each uh, opportunity within PESCO on its merits. Very obviously, uh, PESCO as a vehicle for uh, increasing military mobility around the continent is something that non-EU NATO partners support fully and the UK is within that. But when it comes to industrial or technological cooperation, it won't always be in the UK interest or in the interests of UK industry. And so I think it's right that we consider these things on a case-by-case -case basis. Bye, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The issue of support for you. Question two. Minister. Uh, during his visit to Ukraine on the 12th of January, the Prime Minister signed a historic UK-Ukraine agreement on security cooperation with President Zelensky, illustrating our long-term commitment to support Ukraine. 
The Prime Minister has announced that the UK will provide £2.5 billion in military aid to Ukraine in 2024-25, a £200, 000, uh, 200 million pound increase on the previous two years to cover rapid procurement and gifting of equipment, development of international capability coalitions and training through Op Interflex. Flag bet. I thank the Minister for that response. There is clearly widespread support in this House and in the country for helping Ukraine resist Russian aggression. But concerns that President Zelensky has recently identified the shortage of both arms and ammunition, particularly with regard to the impasse in the US Congress. So what discussions has the Minister had with his counterparts in the EU uh, and other European nations to help bridge that gap in the short term and about how you would deal in the longer term if the election of President Trump reduced spending on NATO in general and Ukraine in particular in the longer term? Well, Mr Speaker, of course we are aware of the scepticism both amongst uh, Republican presidential candidates but also uh, in Congress over funding for Ukraine. That is why UK ministers, the Foreign Secretary, the Secretary of State, myself, Prime Minister, um, have all been in Washington to make the case for the US continuing to support Ukraine no matter what the outcome of the election. Now, second-guessing the US uh, electoral system uh, is probably not uh, that sensible, but it is clear that European manufacturing capacity as it is, notwithstanding the fantastic efforts led by Prime Minister Kallas and Estonia to increase manufacturing of ammunition particularly, have not yet got even to half of the target that they set. And this should be a cause for all of us to consider how we might urgently ramp up manufacturing if the worst would come to the worst. Chair of the Select Committee, Jeremy Quinn. Ukraine can win this war and must win this war. Um, the provision of ammunition and equipment the Minister has touched on, but Ukraine also needs hundreds of thousands of trained personnel. Very much welcome the extension of Interflex and the work that we're doing, but is that not something our allies and ourselves could be doing far more to assist them on? Well, Mr Speaker, um, the right honourable gentleman is uh, right to point to the importance of the training effort, and it gives me the opportunity to reflect on this being this week being the 10-year anniversary of the Russian invasion of Crimea, uh, and that that event gave rise to the beginning of Operation Orbital, uh, and that since then, across Orbital and Interflex, 60,000 Ukrainian troops have been trained. Continuing to train them as individuals, but increasingly as formations, is undoubtedly the key to unlocking the real potential of the Ukrainian armed forces. Ian Blackford. Thank you. Mr Speaker, we've all seen the events over the last few days in Ukraine with the Russian offensive. This must act as a wake-up call to all of us. This is our problem. This is our fight with the Ukrainians to defeat Putin. We need to make sure that we step up the ammunition and the arms that we're shipping to Ukraine now. We need to do that with our European partners, and we need to have a plan, not just for the short term, but for the long term, so we defeat Putin. So what talks is the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary having with the European allies to make sure that Ukraine wins this war? Well, Mr Speaker, these conversations happen all the time. Only last week the Secretary of State was at the latest uh, of the donor conferences, followed by NATO defence ministers. I, I was in Norway a week or so beforehand, having exactly these conversations with allies. The right honourable gentleman is absolutely right that the sort of traditional armaments like artillery ammunition are important, but so too increasingly are novel precision weapon systems that the UK is very much at the forefront of providing to our Ukrainian friends. So Julia Lewis. Is it not time that both sides of this House came together to agree on a common policy of increasing defence expenditure mm. so that by increasing our support for Ukraine, we can set an example to our American allies without whose help there is no future for peace and security in Europe? Mm. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, my colleagues on the opposition front bench know that I try not to throw gratuitous punches in the House, and I know that they are enthusiasts for military spending, but their colleague, the Shadow Chancellor, has thus far declined to say that she will do anything other than the 2% uh, 
uh, target on NATO spending, which is not the same as the government is currently spending, nor what the government currently intends to increase spending to. So the right honourable gentleman's suggestion is timely, and it would be fantastic if over the course of the next hour the right honourable shadow Secretary of State were to make the same commitment as we have. Well, let's try now then. Shadow Secretary of State John Healy. <laughs> Well, Mr Speaker, of course, in the last Labour year of the last government, we were spending 2.5% of GDP on defence, a level that's never been matched in any of the 14 Tory years since. Mr Speaker, uh, the Labour leader and I were at Munich, uh, like the Defence Secretary at the weekend, and the urgency of more help for Ukraine ran through every discussion, (laughs) and everyone was also profoundly moved by Yulia Navalnya speaking even after the news of her husband's death at Putin's hands. This is the brutality the Ukrainians are fighting. This is why UK support must not falter. So we strongly back last month's UK-Ukraine security agreement. The Defence Secretary calls it a 100-year agreement alliance. So will the government take the necessary next step with an implementation plan for this year and future years to make sure Ukraine gets the help it needs now and for tomorrow. Well, Mr Speaker, whilst grateful for the history lesson on what was spent under the previous Labour government, the commitment to match the government spending in a future government was conspicuously absent from the right honourable gentleman's answer. However, back to the collegiate spirit within which defence questions is normally conducted himself, I absolutely agree that the horizon the Secretary of State set out in his speech for the partnership with Ukraine absolutely requires a strategic approach to be taken with very long horizons set for what our cooperation, both industrial and military, could look like. Sean Healy. Well, long horizons are fine, but Ukraine needs more help now. And I'm concerned about this £2.5 billion for Ukraine, announced last month and described by the Prime Minister, as the Minister says, as the biggest single package of defence aid to Ukraine since the war began. In an answer to my question last week, however, the Minister would not rule out using this money to cover the UK's own operational costs at NATO bases. So will he today rule that out? Will he today confirm that every penny and every pound of this 2.5 billion for Ukraine will go to Ukraine? Mr Speaker, the right honourable gentleman, I fear, has missed something over the last two years because the 2.3 billion that the government has provided in support of operations to support Ukraine has always included both the gifting in kind that takes the headlines but also Operation Interflex and other avenues through which we support the Ukrainians. So the fact is that next year's spending and the year after will match exactly what we did in previous years in terms of the breadth of that contribution. It's also true, Mr Speaker, that both the long-term strategic alliance that the Secretary of State set out and the commitment year on year to spend more than any other European ally are not mutually exclusive. We're doing both. Simply spokesperson Martin Dockin, who yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, on the 17th of March at the Munich Conference, uh, Prime Minister Fredriksson of the Kingdom of Denmark actually stated, if you ask a Ukrainian, they're asking for ammunition now, artillery now. From the Danish side, we decided to donate our entire artillery. Doesn't the Secretary of State agree, or at least the Minister, that allies should be a little more like Denmark when it comes to recognising the consequences of not meeting Ukraine's needs? So, Mr Speaker, um, we're full of admiration for our Danish colleagues, um, but the reality is that the UK has provided almost its entire heavy artillery capability in terms of AS-90. Those that we've held behind are those that service the battle group in Estonia and the very high readiness armoured battle group. Similarly, we've been uh, generous with our ammunition stocks whilst retaining those that we need for our VHR forces. More than that, we've catalyzed the production of 155mm ammunition in the UK. And even further, we have been buying up as much 152 and 122mm ammunition around the world as we possibly can. The UK's contribution to the Ukrainian artillery fight is not confined to what we had within our own ammunition stockpiles. It is much, much bigger and amounts to hundreds of thousands of rounds. Martin Doherty. Well, I'm afraid I have to say, Mr Speaker, to paraphrase a former member, the Government's response, I think, is weighted in the balance and found wanting. 
So for the Czech Republic's profound donations of artillery and shells on top of the Danish donation, as well as a commitment of over one million from the EU, I wonder if the Minister, and I hope he can come up to the dispatch box, and correct the balance and advise the House in terms of his new investment, and it is welcome, in terms of the new investment, how much of that is in tactical armaments and in artillery. So the ammunition act, the overseas ammunition acquisition plan from previous years remains broadly as it was, which amounts to about 300,000 rounds uh, bought on international markets uh, and provided to Ukraine. Um, the 155mm uh, manufacture acceleration is subject to a different um, funding package that the Secretary of State and his Ukrainian counterpart have been working on. But it's important to note, Mr Speaker, that the 200 million additional money from last year to this is focused on the provision of drones, and it is those tactical drones that are proving to be most significant in terms of the impact they're having in the battle space. Scott Benton. Question three, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the latest full-time strength of the army is 73,520. The Army is continuing to work towards its future soldier structure with 73,000 regular and 30,000 reserve personnel. There are, no current, there are no current plans to change this. And good news, Mr Speaker, provisional figures suggest that January had the highest number of Army applications for six years. Yeah. Well, Thank you, Mr Speaker. Media reports have suggested that white men have been actively discriminated against in recruitment and that security checks may be relaxed due to promoting ethnic diversity within the army. A number of senior military figures have purportedly warned that the pervasiveness of woke ideology being pushed onto the armed forces is a real and present threat to national security and will give aid and comfort to the king's enemies. Will the planned review of diversity policies seek to address these concerns? Um, well, I'm very grateful for the honourable gentleman's uh, remarks. I don't recognise the situation he describes. We take security extremely seriously and ensure all personnel have security clearance appropriate to their job. Checks normally require at least three years UK residency, but Commonwealth candidates are permitted to accrue qualifying residency while serving, although they cannot take up roles and ranks which require higher levels of vetting. This policy has been in place for several years and it hasn't changed. Tony Antoniazzi. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Look, figures in The Times last month showed that the British Army will shrink to as small as 67,000 by 2026 due to the current crisis in recru recruitment and retention. As threats to the UK are increasing, will the Minister finally commit to halting these cuts uh, that he is continuing to make to the Army? Um, well, the Government is sticking to 73,000 regular and 30,000 reserve personnel, as I said er earlier. Uh, those figures were contained in Future Soldier, published in 2021, and remains unchanged. Jack Brereton. Number four, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the Minister of Defence continues to stand ready to support the FCDO-led effort to pursue land, air maritime routes to delivering urgently needed humanitarian aid. Jack Brereton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Many of my constituents in Stoke-on-Trent South are extremely concerned about the humanitarian crisis in Gaza and want to see much more aid getting into Gaza. This is vitally needed by the innocent civilian population in Gaza. So will uh, the Secretary of State update us on what more is being done to get additional routes into Gaza and particularly to get a sea route for humanitarian aid into those innocent civilians? Well, my honourable friend will be pleased to know that, here that I've been to the region on a number of occasions, visiting Israel, Cyprus twice, Egypt, Saudi, with the specific intention of trying to resolve the problem that he describes. We've delivered 150 tonnes of aid uh, already, but the problem is getting the aid into the country, or into uh, Gaza, I should say. Uh, although we've persuaded the Israelis to open Kiram Shalom, we desperately need Ashdod opened as well, and then we can create a humanitarian aid route from Cyprus, which we've discussed with the Cypriots, uh, direct to Ashdod and straight in via Kiram Shalom. Andrew Salou. Uh, number five, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Families are an integral part of the armed forces community. Our commitment to them remains strong and reinforced through the Haythorn Wait uh, Review and Defence Command paper and Refresh, the family strategy published in January 2022, 
set out this government's response and my honourable friend's excellent living in our shoes framework for delivering more family sympathetic policies. Bruce Lew. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, families of armed forces personnel have to put up with more separation, relocation, and danger to their loved ones than any other public servant. And they often feel slightly disenfranchised. They might not know who their Member of Parliament is. They might fear to approach them for uh, the impact that might have on their spouse or partner's career. So does he agree with me it's incredibly important that there is public visibility on following through on the 86 recommendations the Ministry of Defence accepted in full and the 20 which were accepted in part? Well, Mr Speaker, I have slightly different numbers. My honourable friend will be interested to hear on the number of accepted. I have 106 out of 100. 10 uh, from his uh, report. Uh, regardless of the exact numbers, I entirely agree with him about the importance of making sure that our armed forces families uh, live in accommodation which is decent, uh, that when we ask them to go and fight abroad, when they come home, they have good living accommodation. He'll be pleased to hear that the steering group that he'll be very familiar with, which includes families, federations and authors of my honourable friend's excellence report, meets again on the 28th of this month. Mr Speaker, with permission, I would like to answer questions 6, 7, 12 and 19 together. In a challenging labour market, we continue to apply an array of measures to support recruitment and retention and refine the armed forces offer. These include the biggest pay rise in 20 years, flexible service and an improved accommodation offer. The Haythorn-Thwaite review has a key part to play and teams have been stood up across defence to implement all 67 recommendations working to establish a reward and incentivisation architecture that will attract and retain the skills we need. Mr Speaker, I'm very grateful for that answer. But it's also true that the quality of forces accommodation is an important factor in both recruitment and retention of the armed forces. Would my right honourable friend consider giving local commanders greater agency to get small repairs done locally if the national contractors yeah. fail to act quickly yeah. enough? I absolutely agree with my honourable friend. Heads of establishment can access an approved funding pot to address minor maintenance works up to a maximum value of £25,000 per item, and that's extremely helpful and gets away from some of the bureaucracy that's involved with the prime contractors. Sarah Atherton. Mr Speaker, seven experienced personnel are leaving to five being recruited. Despite efforts being placed on diversity and inclusion policies, some in my opinion being counterproductive, in addition to Capita's initiatives, last year there was a net loss of 310 service women to the military. Falling rates of retention is overshadowing operational effectiveness. Can the Minister outline what he's doing for retention? I am very grateful to my uh, honourable friend and predecessor. Over the past two years, Defence has put service women at the heart of the development and delivery of a range of initiatives, as you well know, knows from uniform policies, provision of accessible sanitary products, mentoring, the introduction of flexible service, wraparound childcare, parental leave, zero tolerance to unacceptable behaviours, and further measures in response to Wigston, Gray, and my honourable friend's report. I pay tribute to those who have been driving change, but it's far from job done. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The armed forces, including the 14 signal regiments based in Pembrokeshire, continue to provide fabulous career opportunities for young people. So does my honourable friend agree with me that now, more than ever, we need to encourage army visits into schools and that the long campaign by nationalists in Wales to stop those kind of visits actually damages social mobility and aspirations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I entirely share my right honourable friend's enthusiasm. <laughs> The Armed Forces is a huge engine for social mobility. The Army achieved over 5,000 school engagement visits from acro across the U United Kingdom in the last year, each of the schools request. The British Army is the public's army. It is important it engages with the people it serves, despite the best efforts of some on the left and the nationalists to which he refers. Louis French. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The London Borough of Bexley is home to a number of excellent cadet and reserve units which teach, vi which teach vital life skills. Could the Minister please update the House on progress on the cadet expansion programme and what work is being undertaken to strengthen the pathways into His Majesty's Armed Forces? Mr Speaker, I am very grateful for the opportunity to do so. The Joint Ministry of Defence and Department for Education cadet expansion programme is ex progressing extremely well. We currently have over 54,000 cadets in school cadet units. The cadet expansion programme has focused on growth in the state sector. 
Since introduction in 2012, the number of cadet units in state schools has grown by over 400 per cent, 268 schools. Some new units have also been opened in, the, in independent schools, and here there has been a 12 per cent increase. I'm sure my honourable friend would join me in welcoming that transformation. Mr Strathern. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Local service personnel routinely cite to me issues in service accommodation as a big barrier to recruitment and retention. So I was really disappointed to hear that the government has no plans to improve the quality of the near 900 SLA accommodation bed spaces in my constituency at Chicktowns that currently fall into the lowest grades before the base closes. Will the Minister commit to revisiting this decision to make sure we do right by all service personnel serving on the base before it closes? The gentleman is absolutely right to highlight the importance, importance of service accommodation. He will be aware, I hope, of the huge investment that government is putting in to not only improving the quality of service family accommodation but also service living economy, accommodation. Our people deserve uh, the best. I think it's public knowledge that they have not had the best for some considerable time. Uh, we are absolutely committed to remedying that, including for his constituents. German. Mr Speaker, doesn't the Minister uh, wake up in the morning sometimes and check on reality? The fact of the matter is we have seven, had seven Secretary of State for Defence since 2010, absolute turmoil in our armed forces, and we, the fact of the matter is why would people join the British Army when a government like this has run us down to 72,000 serving officers? Serving 72. I used to campaign when you took it below 100,000. Wake up and invest in the defence of our country in a troubled world. Well, those are interesting reflections, aren't they, Mr Speaker? I suggest he has a word with his front bench, and in particular the Shadow Chancellor, who to date has failed to commit to the level of spending on the defence of this country that this party, this side, is completely committed to. Andrew Bridgen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The, the rise of so-called woke culture has been infecting our society for many years, and it should be unsurprising that it's now infecting our military. Does the Minister think that the rise of uh, woke makes it easier or more difficult to recruit the right sort of people into our armed forces? Um, well, I completely reject the premise of my uh, honourable friend's uh, question. If he's talking about increasing the amount of women in our armed forces, if he's talking about the LG, the Re Lord Etherton's review into LGBT uh, in, uh, historically in our armed forces, if he's talking about our ambition to make our armed forces more reflective of the society from which they're drawn and which they serve, then, Mr Speaker, I'm as guilty as charged. Jim Shannon. Mr Speaker, can I thank the Minister for, for his answer? Minister, you, you and I will be aware, and many others will be aware, that across Northern Ireland, recruitment uh, to the service that be the Army, the RAF or the Royal Navy was always exceptional. Uh, to ensure that that continues, the TA regiments are, are uh, at a figure and a number where they can't go above. What I would suggest, Mr Speaker, is that maybe here the MOD and the Minister should look at a, a possibility of increasing those numbers of TA soldiers to ensure that the recruitment levels in Northern Ireland can exceed the numbers that are already there. Well, I'm, I'm very grateful. It gives me the opportunity, Mr. Speaker, paying tribute uh, to people of Northern Ireland who, as he says, have contributed disproportionately to the defence of our country. Uh, he will know uh, that we're committed to growing our reserve forces, and of course that means reserve forces right across our United Kingdom. The Minister Luke Pollock. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 24,000 fewer troops, 4,000 fewer sailors, 200 less aircraft and one in five ships removed. The Conservatives have failed our armed forces over the last 14 years, missing their recruitment target every year since taking power in 2010 and hollowing out our military. Does the Minister honestly believe he can look the public in the eye and claim five more years will fix the mess that they have created, or is it time for a fresh start? Oh, I think uh, the honourable gentleman knows what I'm going to say in response to his question, and that is to invite him to have a conversation with the shadow chancellor to commit to the same level of spending on defence as this, as this government is committed to and is spending right now. Is he going to make a spending commitment here and now in the House of Commons? If so, I'm all ears. Can I also suggest it is for the government to, not to be asking them questions? It's for the opposition. Dame Caroline Mr. Speaker, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Rotary Wing Enterprise Programme se seeks to improve aircraft availability across support solutions for Apache, Chinook, Merlin, and Wildcat from within existing budgets. It will do so by driving synergies between platforms, modernising support solutions, and pursuing delivery-focused commercial mechanisms. Sir. Caroline Dynage. Mr. Speaker, as you know, Fleetlands in Gosport has been the home of military helicopter maintenance for over 65 years, and this highly skilled engineering work is really key to levelling up the area, providing much needed jobs and opportunity. But does the Minister agree with me that actually the MOD's Rotary Wing Enterprise and New Medium Helicopter Programme actually would benefit greatly from these generations of expertise and skills right there in Gosport? Well, I, I know from my previous, recent visit that my old friend is a champion not only for defence in her constituency, but in particular for defence jobs. She's right about Standard Aero at Fleetlands Gosport, which is a valued actor in the maintenance of our rotary wing platforms. In terms of the specific rotary, uh, rotary wing enterprise, this is due to enter its detailed design this year, sir. As part of this, it will consider wider social value, including the extent to which economic prosperity is supported. Um, but as this is a specific uh, potential uh, procurement, I cannot comment. And likewise, on new he medium helicopter, we cannot comment on the role of particular companies, but we hope to say more on this very soon. Shadow Minister Maria Riedel. Yeah. Speaker, the government's delayed producing information required for the invitation to negotiate for the new medium lift helicopter four times since September 2022. So can you explain what's caused this 18-month delay? And given the reports last week about this department freezing capital spending until at least the new financial year, when are the government going to get their act together to get this competition underway? Can you promise that the delay won't push back the delivery date for this vital capability for our forces? Well, two things I'm pleased to say. First of all, we will have the uh, announcement on the next stage of the new medium helicopter very, very soon. And I'm pleased to also confirm that we've been clear on our spending position. Perhaps to echo my honourable friend, if the honourable lady wants to talk about um, stuff that's rumoured in the press and we don't have those sorts of capital spending controls, she could confirm that the Shadow Chancellor is going to honour our spending on the Ministry of Defence. Charles Walkley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Number nine, if you please. Mr Speaker, AUKUS partners continue to make very good progress on the optimal pathway to deliver conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines to Australia and to develop the advanced capabilities required. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, and I thank my right honourable friend for his answer. AUKUS is a bold project uh, which rightfully identifies the, the greater need for cooperation in the Pacific between our great nations. However, I don't think it should be limited to just defence. In my own report for the 1922 Fo Foreign Affairs Policy Committee, we found that there's not only a need, but an appetite for wider scope, inclusion of Canada, for example. Uh, does my honourable friend agree that AUKUS cannot be just about defence policy? And are we re reaping the maximum benefits for Britain by consigning to this being just a defence procurement exercise? I mean, where is the FCOD in all this? Well, Mr Speaker, I think my honourable friend is absolutely right to say that AUKUS can and should be a programme which extends beyond the three core nations, the UK, the US and Australia. Uh, but that is very much a matter for the Pillar 2 arrangements rather than the Pillar 1, which the House will know uh, is the nuclear-powered submarine for Australia and the joint procurement. Uh, and he'll be pleased to hear that in, I think it was November, I was in the US uh, making, uh, signing up a programme of Pillar 2 work, which could ultimately extend to others, including Canada and New Zealand. So Desmond Swain. Ten, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The Royal Navy has a range of capabilities to support the engagement of land-based targets. Specific threat planning is considered for every deployment or contingency, and measures are taken to reduce or mitigate those expected threats, as dictated by operational priorities. Sir Desmond. What urgency is attached to the upgrading of HMS Diamond's defence systems? Well, I, my own friend asked an excellent question. I know that uh, there's been a lot of interest uh, following the deployment in the Red Sea and, and what the lessons are. I can confirm that uh, the Sea Viper capability has, of course, been at the forefront of this, being the Navy's weapon of choice in the first shooting down of an aerial threat in more than 30 years. It is a cutting edge weapon system, and I can confirm that Sea Viper will be upgraded to further enhance its capability against the more complex and evolving threats we face, including the ability to intercept missiles in their terminal phase. Lawrence Robertson. Question number 11, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
In the year 2023, the Ministry of Defence spent £25 billion with UK industry. The most recent estimate shows this supported 209,000 jobs across the country, of which 47,000 were in manufacturing, sir. Lawrence Robertson. Thank the Minister for that response. My Tewkesbury constituency contains a lot of uh, aerospace manufacturing, particularly for the defence sectors. But those companies have long complained to me that they can't attract enough young people into their uh, companies, particularly to take engineering jobs. The All Party Parliamentary Group, uh, which I'm co-chairman of, has as its objective uh, to entice young people into engineering, or at least to consider it as a career. Is there anything more the government can do to persuade young people to consider taking up uh, engineering opportunities, which are there? Well, my honourable friend asked an excellent uh, question. I think it helps that we have lots of stalls and young people uh, in the gallery today, being half term. But I can confirm that last year's Defence Command paper identifies skills as a priority, including the shortage of engineering, digital, cyber, STEM subjects, nuclear, and space based skills. The Defence Head of Profession for Engineering, who also supports the Government Science and Engineering Head of Profession, has a Defence Youth Engagement Strategy that drives STEM outreach activities and the encouragement of engineering uptake in, eight, in individuals aged 4 to 14. Sir. Support. 13, please, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Everything I had intended to say in response to the honourable gentleman was covered in the supplementary to question two. Richard Board, why wasn't it group then? <laughs> May said of NATO that it existed, amongst other things, to keep the Soviet Union out and the Americans in. The Foreign Secretary was misunderstood on a recent visit to the United States when he proposed that Congress should pass a new military aid package for Ukraine and he was rebuffed by some Republicans in the House of Representatives. What can the Defence Secretary do to encourage the US to maintain its commitment to Ukraine and to NATO? Well, Mr Speaker, uh, again, we covered this earlier, but it's an important issue. The Secretary of State, uh, me, other ministers from the MOD, and indeed from across the whole of government, put our shoulder to the wheel whenever we are in Washington, not only to impress on the US the importance of its continued commitment to Ukrainian security, but also that Euro-Atlantic security is integral to US security and that the US cannot simply look towards the Pacific. It needs to remain engaged in the Euro-Atlantic in its own, tra own interests, as well as those of NATO allies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On my last visit to Ukraine a couple of weeks ago, I had several meetings with Ukrainian government ministers who voiced their frustration and their concern about the delay in setting up joint operations with UK defence manufacturers. Is there anything that I, can I ask my honourable friend to assure the House that he's doing everything possible to speed this process up to allow the Ukrainians to produce their own kit with our help so that they can help in the war? <coughs> Mr Speaker, the Secretary of State and the Minister for Defence Procurement have both been heavily engaged in this. Indeed, the Minister for Defence Procurement led a delegation to Kyiv to catalyse exactly uh, the idea that the Honourable Gentleman um, mentions. Number 14, Mr Speaker. Minister. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. The MOD has already started its decarbonisation journey in support of the UK's net zero commitment. At the Royal International Air to Two last year, I was pleased to sign the Defence net, uh, net Zero Aviation Charter on behalf of MOD. Working closely with our industrial partners, we are moving to cleaner and more efficient technology. The Army is building solar farms and we have invested £14 million in battlefield electrification. The Royal Navy's cutting edge catalytic systems are reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, gases in its patrol vessels by up to 97%. And finally, Mr. Speaker, the RAF is pioneering the use of sustainable aviation fuel. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, it was a pleasure to attend the Global Charge Dinner last October to see so many. Uh, members of the armed forces from all ranks committed um, to tackling the climate crisis. However, defense, the Defence Select Committee has described um, the MOD's carbon reduction targets as insufficiently demanding under the greening government commitments. They are the lowest across all government. Will the Minister ensure that the next round of CC commitments will contain more demanding targets, not least to reflect the real ambitions um, for the um, members of the armed forces on the ground to see the devastation of climate change? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the Honourable Lady makes, uh, uh, I know she's very passionate about this. What I would stress to her, I've just listed the ways in which the individual services are taking steps to reduce their emissions. But of course, we have to always balance that against our overwhelming priorities department, which is to support the ability of our armed forces to defend these islands. Yes, absolutely. Dean, sir. Uh, Mr Speaker, Def Defence is investing over £6.6 billion in advanced research and development, working with UK industry and academia 
to identify and invest in innovative technologies, ensuring we have the capabilities we need to defeat our adversaries. Sir Edward. <laughs> Traditionally, the RAF has a very poor record uh, when it closes its bases in Lincolnshire, just walking away and leaving the rack and ruin. But this time, we had wonderful schemes for RAF Scampton in terms of defence innovative technology, such as a spaceport. Will the Minister now work with the Home Office and myself to try and release the bulk of this base so that we can get all these exciting technologies going? The MOD can't just wash its hands of this base now that it's passed it to the Home Office. We're supposed to have joined up government. Well, I said, my, my friend makes an important point. What I would state to him is obviously um, RF, uh, as he knows, is no longer part of the defence estate. It means we don't have that formal responsibility for it. What I would stress to him is that we are innovating, uh, investing in innovation in Lincolnshire, including, for example, the significant investment into Waddington associated with our protector capability. Patrick Reddy. Mr. Speaker, number 16. <laughs> oh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and <clears throat> I apologise. The Dreadnought submarine programme remains within overall budget and on track for the first of class HMS Dreadnought to enter service in the early 2030s. Inflation has remained higher than expected for an extended period and has had an adverse impact on the cost forecast for the programme when compared to the forecast from a year earlier. As the programme is in its preliminary phases, it is too early to provide cost estimates for the replacement warhead programme. Patrick Reddy. Mr Speaker, I think what that means is the Minister doesn't know what the total lifetime cost of Trident replacement is going to be. Budgets in government departments and households alike are under immense pressure because of rampant inflation. So why does everybody else's budget have to be under pressure, but the blank cheque seems to be the approach to the renewal of Trident? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's an extraordinary thing to say by the Honourable Gentleman. He, he knows we will shortly be publishing, before the end of the financial year, our supplementary estimate for the Defence Nuclear Enterprise for the financial year. But as he knows, there's a cost in not having a deterrent. That, that is his policy, to do away with the deterrent on a unilateral basis, despite all the terrible threats we can see in the world and the nuclear sabre rattling from Russia. His policy would be abject folly. We will invest in providing that ultimate guarantee to the people of the United Kingdom. James Gray. Mr Speaker, I know that the, the Minister and most of the House, leaving aside the Scottish National uh, benches, would agree with me that continuous at sea deterrence is an absolutely central part of the defence of the realms. No question yeah, yeah, yeah. about right, that right. at all. And would you all agree with me that we must find a way of replacing Trident within, the, within budget? And the worst possible thing that could possibly occur to Trident would be an SNP government in Scotland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I agree 100% with my old friend. We now come to Topitals, Greg Smith. <laughs> Mr Speaker, this year I visited the United States, the White House and Capitol Hill to lobby on behalf of Ukraine, uh, as discussed today, Saudi Arabia and Egypt for the crisis in the Middle East, HMS Diamond to thank the ship's crew uh, and also our sovereign base at Akrotiri uh, to thank the typhoon pilots. The Cyprus itself uh, was also visited. And last week I was in Brussels at NATO and Munich for the security uh, conference. The whole House will know that defence never sleeps and will wish to join me in thanking the brave men and women yeah. who made that possible. Greg Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can my right hon. Friend update the House on progress made at the NATO Defence Minister's meeting in particular regard to support for Ukraine? Indeed I can. Alongside the NATO meeting was actually the Ukraine Defence uh, contact group, which is 52 countries, all of whom support Ukraine. Um, the big concern, of course, is to make sure that Ukraine both has the things it needs now, but also the planning to make sure that in 2024 it can uh, both sustain and push back the, uh, the, the, the fight against the enemy. And that is why uh, the work that this country does, in particular in drones, where I announced £200 million, uh, together with a 15-nation coalition for multinational procurement, uh, that's an initiative called MPI, and also welcomed Australia at my request, who've joined us in the International Fund of Ukraine with $50 million uh, for a fund which is now worth $900 million. Shadow Secretary of State John Healy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, the agonies of the Palestinian people are extreme. We all want to fight. They want the fighting to stop now. Uh, hostages returned now, aid ramped up now, and a ceasefire that lasts permanently. What is the Defence Secretary doing 
to help his Israeli counterpart accept that their threatened offensive against Rafa just cannot happen. Well, Mr Speaker, I agree with the right honourable gentleman about the seriousness of the situation. And as he's just heard, I visited uh, Israel actually just before the new year and had these conversations direct. I believe that it's both in uh, Israel's interest, obviously Gaza's interest, and the world's interest to see uh, this immediate cessation followed by, by, followed by a permanent ceasefire. We are doing everything that we can to both persuade the Israelis of that necessity, but also put pressure on Hamas, who still hold yeah. hostages. Uh, if they were to release them, this thing could finish very quickly. We're also uh, helping uh, by ensuring that uh, we are working on plans for what happens in the north of the country, or southern Lebanon as well. Speaker, Carlshaw and Wellington is home to over 1,700 veterans who have and continue to provide amazing service to our great nation. So could the Secretary of State please update me into what steps we are taking as a government to provide better support for veterans in our country? I am very grateful to my honourable friend. Uh, since 2011, the Armed Forces Covenant and its consequentials uh, have been the absolute linchpin for public commitment to those who have served, and it has materially improved the lived experience of the service community. The MOD is responsible for a number of services for veterans. The Veterans Welfare Service, for example, supports around 50,000 veterans every year, and the Office for Veterans Affairs coordinates across government to advance support for veterans and their families. Shadow Minister Steve McKay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With the number of veterans claiming welfare benefits rising steadily and more than 52,000 now in receipt of universal credit, does the Minister find this a cause for celebration or concern? Uh, I am a veteran, um, Mr Speaker. I talk to veterans all the time, as does my right honourable friend uh, who heads up the Office of Veterans Affairs, and I don't recognise a picture that he has uh, described. Uh, we have, since 2011, materially improved the lived experience of our veteran community and their families, and we will con continue to do that. Of that, you can be absolutely sure. Sarah Atherton. When defence contract bids are awarded, there is a 10 to 20 per cent weighting given to social value, social value being the benefit that that contract would have to the local and wider community. Could the Minister clarify that this community benefit is entirely for the UK, or are overseas companies and their communities considered equally to the UK? So it is a very good question, my friend. I think the distinction here, uh, Mr Speaker, is between the Cabinet Office social value rules, which are applied across government uh, and which are irrespective, and the rules that we apply as the Ministry of Defence for our procurements, which, if, for example, there was discussion of new medium helicopter earlier, when that comes out, as I hope it will soon, it will be clear that we are, we are looking to incentivise a strong commitment to the UK industrial base. Holly Lynch. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The MOD recently published the findings of the inquiry into the fatal accident involving a scimitar fighting vehicle on Salisbury Plain, in which a young soldier tragically lost his life. One of my constituents was a witness to the accident, which has inevitably had a profound impact on him. The government has said that it does not plan to make a formal response to the inquiry report, which is a harrowing read, but it has accepted all 52 recommendations. Does not the Minister think it requires a full and formal response from the government with a detailed action plan for adopting the 52 recommendations, given the seriousness of the incident and the wider implications for our order? Please, just remember it is top because I have got to get other members in. Mr Speaker, very simply, I actually read the uh, report and, as uh, she rightly points out, accepted all of the findings. We don't usually uh, take it further, but I'll certainly be happy to take a look at uh, the case she raises. Well, Francois, Thank you, sir. on the subject of recruitment and retention, on the 7th of November, the Chief of the General Staff, Patrick Summers, arguably the best general of his generation, told the Defence Committee the following, and I quote, we are taking 400 soldiers out of the field army to put them alongside recruiters because, guess what, it takes a soldier to recruit a soldier. Never a truer word was spoken. So when are we finally going to sack capital? 
<laughs> well, I thank my right of friend for his, his question. I knew he'd get Capita in there somewhere. Uh, he, he will be familiar with Engage to Recruit, which is a programme that's currently underway uh, and has having some success in getting soldiers to recruit soldiers. That's probably why, as I touched upon in my earlier answer, we are seeing now some extremely promising recruiting figures, including in January the best figures for six years. Clive Bert, Speaker, Israel so far has ignored international appeals not to attack indiscriminately civilians and not to take steps which are, are basically raising Gaza to the ground. It now looks as like it's going to ignore international opinion about entering Rafah. So has it not now time come for us to consider not selling arms to Israel, which can be used in these totally unacceptable ways. Well, Mr. Speaker, arms uh, deals and uh, export licences are dealt with in the normal way, but the honourable member will be interested to hear that actually there's not very much uh, arms sales in the direction of Israel that takes place at all. Off the top of my head, I think it was for just £42 million last year, and it was mostly protective uh, equipment. Uh, late last year, diesel got into the water supply at the uh, Clemshard Lions camp near Upavon in my constituency, and I commend the resilience of the families that live there and also of the MOD, which acted very quickly to ensure there was a temporary supply of water. They're still living on that temporary supply, so can the Minister assure me that attention is being given to sorting out this problem and ensuring a permanent supply of clean water? Well, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for raising this. He's a champion of the defence uh, community in his constituency. I'm grateful for his early engagement on this. Um, as I understand, following completion of rigorous testing by the local authority regulator, they've confirmed the water quality at Trenchard lines is acceptable. And as I understand, um, it is now safe for personnel working and living there to use the main supply. But I will double check and will write to him. But I'm grateful for his comments on the performance of DIO in this regard. Jeff Smith. Yeah. Th thank you, Mr Speaker. We've seen news today of another serious attack by the Houthis on a commercial vessel in the Gulf of Aden. Do ministers think that more Royal Navy ships will, be, will need to be deployed to the region, given the ongoing threat to merchant shipping? Well, the Honourable Gentleman will be familiar with the answers I gave, I think, last week or the week before at the dispatch box, where uh, I said that we will always look at what's happening in the sea, in the Red Sea. I've been there to uh, see, uh, meet the crews myself. And we'll make a judgment based on uh, the reality on the ground. We do know and we welcome uh, now the input from uh, a conglomeration of EU countries who are coming to join uh, Prosperity Guardian as well. Sir Julian Lewis. In the debate on the Red Sea on 24th of January, I asked for confirmation that HMS Albion and HMS Bulwark would not only not be scrapped but would not be mothballed either. The Deputy Foreign Secretary with the Secretary of State alongside him uh, said in response that I was absolutely right to detect the supportive view of the Secretary of State for Defence. However, a journalist subsequently was told that nothing had ch changed by the Ministry of Defence. So are these ships going to be mothballed or not? Mr Speaker, my right honourable friend can rest easy. I've actually been down since those questions. Uh, visited uh, HMS Albion. I can confirm that uh, one of those ships will always be being made ready to uh, sail, uh, and uh, I think he can therefore be very relieved. Mr. Twist. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Suicide rates amongst veterans under 24 years old are two to four times as high as in the civilian population, but figures show that this group is less likely to be in touch with mental health services. How will the Minister ensure that young veterans? can access the support they need. Grateful for the question, and she's been consistent in her inquiry into this matter. Uh, she'll be reassured to know that across the uh, service community, the rate of suicide is lower than we would expect in the civilian population. There is a subset within the serving population among young men where there is an excess, and we're looking very closely at that. And I very much commend to her the suicide action plan that we have published, which, which lays out what Defence is doing to drive down the suicide rate in our armed forces. Whichever figure it is, is too high. James Gray. Speaker, the whole House, I think, would like to see a larger Army, Navy and Air Force. Thank you for unanimity on that particular point. And central to that must be the Armed Force Recruitment Programme, but also the Army Centralised uh, Training uh, Scheme. Will my honourable friend confirm to me that the pause which was announced last week in the press, in capital spending the MOD will not affect those two schemes, and they will continue as, in as full blood of the way as they are at the moment. Yeah, yeah. My right honourable friend would be pleased to know there is no pause. The, the, the uh, approvals are flowing. 
Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Royal Navy carriers HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Prince of Wales entered service respectively six and seven years late and cost more than 20 times the cost of Scotland's ferries, rocketing to over £8,000 million and plagued with problems and a lack of actual aircraft. What assurances can we have that these hugely expensive carriers will provide the defence capability for which they were designed? (laughs) (laughs) Mr Speaker, I think the whole House recognises the irony of an SNP spokesman (laughs) talking to us about ships being delivered late. Actually, I, I think actually... The whole House will want to welcome the extraordinary work done by uh, those on HMS Prince of Wales who got the ship ready to leave, uh, not at 30 days' readiness, which is what they were uh, racked for, but in eight days. And I would have thought congratulating the ship's company would be the right thing to do. Very Sherman. Mr Speaker, does the Secretary of State remember that the British Army used to be the biggest trainer of young men and women in the country? We produce so many skilled people. When can he take us back to those balmy days? Well, we have been training since 2014 60,000 Ukrainian troops, uh, proving that we know how to get troops trained. We still train extraordinary numbers, and I think I'm right in saying when it comes to uh, the, the broader a link through to uh, all of the forms of uh, training, uh, we are breaking some of those records as well. We're going to ensure that we uh, have a, uh, armed forces who are fit for the 21st century. That completes questions. We now come to the urgent question, Rachel Reeves. To ask the Chancellor of the Exchequer if he will make a statement on the UK economy entering recession. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. High inflation remains the biggest barrier to growth, which is why halving it is still our top priority. Thanks to decisive action supported by the government, inflation has fallen from over 11% to 4%. The Bank of England is forecasting it will fall to around 2% by early summer in only a matter of months, much faster than previously thought. Now, it's important, Mr Speaker, to put this all in context. Just over a year ago, the Bank of England was forecasting the longest recession in a hundred years. That has not happened, Mr Speaker, and the British economy has proved resilient in the face of unprecedented shocks. Forecasters, including the Bank of England and the IMF, agree that growth will strengthen over the next few years, with the IMF forecasting that we will grow faster than Japan, Germany, France and Italy, many others, on average over the next five years. Wages have been higher than inflation for six months in a row. Unemployment remains very low, Mr Speaker. And we are backing British business by delivering the biggest business tax cut in modern British history and rewarding work by cutting taxes for working people. These are all reasons to be positive about the economy turning a corner. If we stick to our plan, we can be confident in seeing pressures reduced for families and in achieving healthy economic growth. At the autumn statement, we unveiled 110 growth measures, including unlocking £20 billion of business investment. This includes a substantial labour market package, delivering a tax cut to national insurance for 27 million people, reforming pensions, extending investment zones as well. The real risk to include, Mr Speaker, to economic growth and prosperity in this country is the fact that the Labour Party has no plan for growth, no plan at all. Whilst they may pretend to us here that they have abandoned their £28 billion pledge, they are still committed to their damaging 2030 energy policy, which they themselves, indeed the Leader of the Opposition himself, has said costs £28 billion. All of us across this House know what that means – higher taxes and lower growth with the Labour. 
Shout out to Chelsea Exchequer, Rachel Reeves. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Chancellor should be here in Parliament explaining why Britain has fallen into recession. Can the Minister explain why he has been left to answer these questions and where exactly is the Chancellor today? Yeah. The Chancellor should be accountable to MPs and to our constituents and answer for his failure in this House. What an insult to all those people who go to work every day and experience the reality of 14 years of Conservative economic failure that he has simply failed to turn up. So let me ask the Minister, does he accept that the Prime Minister's promise to grow the economy is now in tatters. Will the Minister explain why the economy is now smaller than when the current Prime Minister entered 10 Downing Street? Does the Minister accept the misery that this Government has caused homeowners with their kamikaze budget, leaving a typical family renewing their mortgage, paying an additional £240 every single month? Now, the Chief Secretary is also notable for her absence today last seen refusing or simply failing to recognise that their target measure of debt as a share of GDP is rising, not falling. Following her rebuke this morning from the UK Chair of the Statistics Authority about misleading the public, could the Minister inform the House if the Chief Secretary will again be relying on incompetence as her best defence? Mr Speaker, it's not good enough. The whole country knows that the economy is not working for working people under the Conservatives. It is time for change. And if the government seriously thinks that everything is fine, then why don't they take their record of failure and let the British people decide? Thank you, Mr Speaker. And, uh, I, I, I thank the, the Shadow Chancellor for her questions. But, but no, it's right. I, I'm, I'm coming onto it. I'm coming onto it now. The, the, where she started was to uh, talk about the Chancellor. Well, I am the Economic Secretary. I'm perfectly entitled to answer on behalf of the department, and uh, and I will do so today. But she, but the main, the main uh, thrust of her remarks was uh, was on growth. And let me uh, deal with those. In detail, the first point to recognise, Mr. Speaker, is indeed the international context that we all find ourselves in. Well, it, it, well, it happens to be true, Mr. Speaker. And, for example, to describe that international context, ten EU countries were in recession in 2023. In relation to uh, forecasts, the OBR forecasts originally that, that there would be a contraction of 1.5% in the economy, uh, and we have significantly outperformed that. The Bank of England, as I have already said, forecast the longest recession in 100 years. We have significantly outperformed that. And wages for six months in a row, I think this is the sixth month where this would be the case, have, are higher than inflation, which, as I've already said, we have more than halved. Now, in relation to the Chief Secretary, what the Chief Secretary was explaining is that... Well, what the Chief Secretary was explaining is that we were and continue to meet our fiscal rule, which is that debt will be falling in the fifth year of the forecast, excluding the Bank of England. And that is what she's explained, and that's what, she, and that's what I am reiterating for the House now. Um, and just to finish off, Mr Speaker, because they don't like, they don't like hearing this, but they have got absolutely no plan on the economy. We have been clear about our plan, and the plan is starting to bear fruit with wages, with cutting, with cutting taxes for working people starting in January, with higher business investment as a result of our full expensing put in the autumn statement. And he doesn't have to take it from me, Mr Speaker. The Office for Budget Responsibility said the two fiscal events in 2023, both the budget and the autumn statement, would represent the largest increase to the GDP level that they have ever scored. So what I would say to her, and indeed the House, our plan is working, stick with the plan, don't throw it away with the opposite. Sir John Redwood. It is good news that unemployment has stayed low by European standards and the economy is still generating plenty of job vacancies. 
So will the government take more steps to help more people into those jobs so that we can get faster growth, bring the benefit bill down and boost their incomes? I, I thank my right hon. Friend for his question. and Indeed, the whole House knows that he uh, is somewhat of an expert on uh, matters in relation to the economy. What I would... <laughs> what, I would, what I would say to answer his point very specifically is that the national insurance tax cut was scored at the last fiscal event, the autumn statement, to significantly increase the number of people that would be in work as a result. And though I won't, of course, speculate on fiscal events, you know, that point has been very much noted by me and the whole Treasury. Mr Speaker, the Minister spoke about resilience, but the fourth quarter contraction in the economy was the biggest quarterly fall since early 2021 at the height of the COVID pandemic. So I'm not sure he's quite right about resilience. He also spoke about growth, but the government told us in November growth is not forecast to exceed 2% in any year in the forecast period. How modest the Minister's ambitions are. The national debt is still approaching 100 per cent of GDP, £3 trillion. The consequences of Brexit are suppressing growth. Yeah, yeah. And this does pose a challenge to the UK Government's own fiscal targets. Now, while it is welcome inflation has fallen, prices remain high. Prices are not falling. Prices are simply going up slightly less steeply than they were a month or two ago. It's obvious what the economy needs is growth and the investment to generate that growth. But given business investment, according to the government, is forecast down this year, 5.6%. Given private dwelling investment is forecast down this year, 6%, flat at 0% next year. And given general government investment is forecast down in 25, 26, 27 and 28, where is the investment for the growth going to come from? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, to take the honourable gentleman, who I deeply respect his points one by one, the point on resilience, I think that the way how we get resilience for ordinary people and for households is to make sure that real household incomes increase and since 2010 they are up 12 per cent. In relation to business resilience, that is why we are trying now to increase with our uh, full expensing regime, which is revolutionary in the advanced world. With the full expensing, that will enable more businesses to invest and to deal with a chronic, chronic uh, weakness of the British economy, which is weak investment. That is why we are doing that. He mentioned growth. Now, of course, growth uh, is not as high as we would like. Indeed, that is the case across the whole of Europe and across the whole of the industrialised world. That is why the Chancellor, in the last fiscal event, put in place 110 growth measures, Mr Speaker. So we, are, we have a plan for growth over the long term and we will deliver it. The, 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 honourable, member, the honourable Member mentioned debt. The Honourable, mem honourable Member mentioned debt. And indeed, that is why, to repeat my point to the Shadow Chancellor, that is why debt is falling in the fifth year, in the, in the fifth year of the forecast, according to our fiscal rule, which is excluding the Bank of England. And that, by the way, was not just the fiscal rule now, it has always been the fiscal rule. And in relation to inflation, yes, he makes the fair point that inflation does not mean that prices are falling. Indeed, inflation, of course, is a lower rate of increase. We all know that in this House. And indeed, we've, that's why bringing down inflation is so important. And the party opposite, with their plan to recklessly jack up borrowing and taxes to the, sake, to the, to the extent of £28 billion, will increase inflation. Um, and to finish my remarks, in relation to investment, just to repeat, Investment has been a long-term weakness of the British economy. We are taking long-term measures to deal with it, and I hope that in the next fiscal event in the budget we will continue in that vein. Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, and may I thank my honourable friend for his distinguished service as a voice of His Majesty's Government and refer him to what the former Chief Economist of the Bank of England, Andrew Haldane, has said today referring to a double blow to the credibility of the Bank of England, which was late to put interest rates up and missed inflation, 
and has been slow to reduce them, hammering the economy. Does my honourable friend agree that the Bank of England is no longer showing itself to be competent and its independence must be questioned? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think I will quite agree with my right honourable friend, but what I will say is that it's very, very important that we, we leave the Bank of England to, to do its work, respect their independent mandate, but from the Treasury, we do what we can to make sure that we bring inflation down and support them in that mandate. And as I say, the party opposite, their plans, whether they claim that they've dropped them or not, their plans will lead to an increase of borrowing or an increase in taxes that will significantly damage that end. Dame Angela Eagle. Well, I think the Minister's failing the, opposition, uh, the, the audition. I really do. I, I, I think um, we're not going to take lectures uh, from a person about borrowing when it was 67% of GDP when we left office and it's now nearly 100%. Mm, yeah. He's come in here and he's claiming somehow that growth is happening, but we're actually in a recession, which means that there's no growth. In fact, yeah. there's negative yeah. growth. Yeah. Right. And if you look, Mr Speaker, GDP per capita yes. fell in every quarter yes. of last year, meaning that everybody is getting yeah. worse <coughs> off under his appalling stewardship of the economy. Isn't yeah. it time? that the minister, the junior minister, went back to his boss and told him it's all over, time's up, call the general. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thank the right honourable yeah. lady. Yeah, yeah. I thank the right honourable lady. Um, but I, you know, it is definitely above my pay grade to call elections. What I would say, in relation to the points that she says precisely, are the following. In relation to per capita GDP statistics, and that's an important statistic, because what the point of that is to try and get a sense as to what's happening to individuals or individual households and families. What I would say to her is let me, well, I wish the Honourable, the Shadow Chancellor would allow me to, uh, to respond, is real household incomes, which is as good a measure as any to see what is happening to individuals and families in our economy, is up 12% since 2010. If you're looking at people at the bottom of the, incomes, uh, the income scale, since, the, uh, since 2010, the rise in the national living wage that comes in in April will mean that there will be a rise of about 30% in real terms for people on full-time minimum wages. That, those two statistics are examples of what's happening to real people on the ground. Rachel McLean. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for updating the House. And he, will he agree that obviously people in Redditch and elsewhere are concerned about negative economic news, although it almost always turns out to be wrong later on? But does he agree, most of all, that the greatest risk to my constituents in Redditch and across the country is a Labour government who have said that they can somehow magically get £28 billion of green growth benefits without paying for it. Well, we all know who will be paying for it. It's my constituents through extra borrowing and higher taxes. He has no responsibility for the Labour Party. Let us move on. Stella Creasy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Government Minister says that the priority for the Government is backing British business, says it's cutting inflation, the priority being reducing the pressure on British families. Why then, when the Government also admits this measure will increase inflation, when British business is tearing its hairs out at the chaos that's being caused by not knowing what the charge will be and who will pay it with less than 10 weeks to go, and British consumers will find it causes food shortages and an increase in food prices. Why on earth is this government going ahead with the Brexit border tax? And will he here and now commit to cancelling it so that we can stop the inflationary measure? Yes or no? I thank the Honourable Lady's focus on inflation. Indeed, she's right, inflation is absolutely critical, um, and bringing it down is an absolute focus for the government. And uh, the House has heard her, her point in relation to uh, the European Union. Um, but what I would add is simply to say that we have a clear plan for bringing down inflation that we have carried out, that we'll continue to carry out, and she's got to ask her front bench why they don't have one. Sir Edward Lee, uh, for too long, too many people in the Treasury, not my honourable friend who's an excellent minister, but too many, too many people there have thought the best way to grow the economy was to fill the country with more and more people. So will the government now commit itself or recommit itself 
to insisting that if you come here to work, you should earn average UK earnings around £33,000 a year. No shortage schemes, no exemption for care workers or the NHS, but in those sectors we pay proper wages, we get people off benefit, there's too many people on benefit dragging down our economy, we cut seriously mass legal migration, and by the way, if there is a general election, we give something for our people to vote for. The, my honourable friend makes a, uh, an important point about migration, and I completely agree with him that what we need to see is an economy where we get higher earnings for British people. That does not mean we have an economy where we import too many people and keep earnings down. That's why we've been focusing on raising uh, the national living wage. That's why uh, we're focusing on making sure that ordinary household incomes, as I've already explained, are going to go up as a result of this government's policies. Uh, and what is, also worth, uh, what is also worth pointing out to the House is that in relation to, for example, last year's immigration numbers, obviously there were certain individual things that happened last year, in particular um, people fleeing from Ukraine, in particular people from Hong Kong as well, that meant that last year's were particularly high immigration numbers, but the broad thrust of what he says is correct. We want a high-skill, high-wage economy. Emma Harvey. Speaker, I don't know if the Minister realises quite how infuriating people find watching his government tell them that everything is fine and it's all going really well and there's nothing to see here, when what they're experiencing every day is the fact that they're feeling poorer and small businesses are closing. So if the Prime Minister and Chancellor can't face reality, how on earth can anyone trust them to solve the economic crisis their government created? Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to be clear with the Honourable Lady, who I've got a huge amount of time for and is a very good Member of Parliament, that it is not, it is not our position that everything is OK. It is our position that we have been in a very challenging international context. There's been a once-in-a-hundred-year pandemic. There was an energy crisis caused by Putin's war in the Ukraine. And this government has done everything we possibly can to build an economy for growth. That's what we're doing, and I hope to get her support in us doing so. So Desmond Swain. What distinguishes this recession is the 800 jobs for every day that have been created since this government came to power in 2010. The very antithesis of anything ever achieved by a Labour government, which has always left unemployment higher than it found it, isn't it? It is, Mr Speaker, and I would add something else. If you look at something, for example, like a, a statistic such as home repossessions, much higher when there was a recession, when the, last, when the Labour Party was in office in 2008-09, comparison with our record now. Unemployment now, much lower, through unemployment now, much lower than in the recession that we saw under the Labour government in 2008-09. And our record, though we are in challenging times, we, the economy is turning a corner, our record does compare very favourably with theirs. Dear Mayor. Now, the Chancellor said last May that he was comfortable with the prospect of a recession, and now that my constituents in Selby and Ainsty are suffering under that recession's effect, would the Minister chalk it up as a job well done? <laughs> He'll do well this day, that Chancellor. What, what I would say is there is nobody on this side of the House who welcomes adverse economic situation for anybody. That's why we are doing everything we can, straining every sinew to grow the economy. And that's why all the measures that I've laid out so far will continue. And they are put at risk, I'm afraid, by his front bench being in office. Duncan Baker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Before I came into this House, I was actually a director of a quite a large retail group in North Norfolk. And the point that absolutely nobody has made is that in the last quarter of the year, Babette, Kieran, Debbie, Elgin, Fergus and Gerrit, six major storms and floods that the country oh, saw. Yes. In the previous year, how many were there? Absolutely none at all. So can the Economic Secretary tell everybody, of course you are not going to have an economy functioning properly when they are in a grip of storms and floods every fortnight and we are not in a recession. The more we talk it up, the more we will be. I, I, thank, the, I thank my honourable friend for that. And, um, I would say that large retail groups in Norfolk's loss is the House's gain. Um, the, the, the point he makes about international, 
Uh, the international context, however, is a really serious and important one, because though the honourable, though, though the honourable members opposite don't like to hear it, if you face, if if one faces a once in a hundred year pandemic, and Putin's illegal war in Ukraine that sees energy energy prices skyrocket, that will have adverse impacts on the economy. The country understands that, the House understands that, and the Labour front bench should also understand that. How about? It's a direct result by the choices that this government has made. Years of potential for growth have been missed, and the government has particularly failed to capitalise on the green transition. Green investment will be worth a trillion um, by 2030 globally, including half a million jobs in this country. When will the government bring forward a green investment programme to match the one in the US or in Europe? Here, here. I thank the Honourable Lady for that point. The first point I make to her is that our, when you look at our record on decarbonisation, it beats anywhere else in the G7. So we've got no, uh, you know, we don't take lessons from the United States or any other country in that regard. But in relation to the green investment plan by 2030 that she mentions, I would ask her to direct, you know, she should direct her ire. At, at the Labour front bench for not being clear as to what their plan actually is. Then the leader of the opposition says that, well, it's important because this, this politics is about a contest of ideas, Mr Speaker, as indeed it is as about a contest um, between two parties. And if the party opposite believes that they can spend an extra £28 billion pounds um, without having an impact of taxes and borrowing, then they are, not, they are trying to pull the wool over the eyes of the British people. Forward. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The past couple of years have been very difficult economically, and I certainly do not treat the state of our economy as the giggle feast that the Labour members seem to be having today. Over the past few weeks, I have met many businesses in my constituency, large and small, and a number of them have told me that they feel that the conditions are getting better, that demand is growing and orders are coming back. Constituents have also told me that they have noticed food prices dropping in our supermarkets. Does the Minister agree with me that the most damaging thing that could happen to our economy now would be if politicians on the benches opposite continue to talk our economy down? I thank, I thank my right honourable gentleman, and indeed she's correct. Forgive me. I thank the right honourable lady. Uh, indeed, indeed, she is correct that things are starting to get better for many, many people across the country. Indeed, small businesses, because inflation is now down below 4%. We've more than halved inflation. We think that in the coming months it will go to 2% the target. And of course, once it hits that target, we hope that interest rates will start coming down, which will make a big, big difference to ordinary people up and down this country. Sir Stephen Timms. Mr Speaker, I applaud the Minister's willingness to take on this unenviable assignment, unlike his right honourable friends. The international context that he's referred to is that Japan and UK are the only G7 countries in recession. Inflation that he's referred to is the highest in the UK at the whole of the G7. Why is it that the UK economy is doing so much worse than comparable economies elsewhere? The Right Honourable Gentleman's uh, point is an interesting one, but I would say the following. When, when our economy entered difficult times, is different is at a different point in the cycle to when certain other economies did. So really, to assess fully the performance of all economies, we have to wait for the end of this whole period to assess it. So I wouldn't prejudge exactly at this stage. And what I would also say to him is simply that uh, when we are in the difficulties that we're in, they have affected absolutely every single economy. The nature of different economies affects them at different times, but we are putting in place comprehensive growth measures, comprehensive measures to bring inflation down. I would also note that interest rates are roughly middle of the pack in the UK compared with other jurisdictions of, comparable, of countries of comparable size, but indeed we'll keep all of this under review and at the next fiscal event uh, we will can take further measures to increase our potential growth rate over the long term. Alexander Stafford. 
Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. Does the Minister welcome the news that the South Yorkshire Mayor has finally recognised the economic importance of Doncaster Airport and is at last starting to use the powers given to him to get that airport up and running again and start that process? But does he agree with me that it's taken far too long, it's taken years since the airport closed, and the South Yorkshire Mayor should have used those powers years ago rather than waiting nine months up until nine weeks until he's re-elected? I thank the Honourable Gentleman for pointing out once again what a brilliant champion he is for his constituency, and I'm sure his constituents have heard that comment and will continue, and he will continue to make that point. Sir Christopher Bryant. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Lordy, lordy. I mean, it really is. It, it's like listening to the Red Queen in Alice Through the Looking Glass, who invented six impossible things before breakfast. How on earth can we have confidence in what the Minister is saying, considering that the UK Statistics Authority has had to tell off the Chief Secretary to the Treasury for, um, for, saying that, uh, for making false claims about tax cuts, um, when Evan Davis had to school her um, at length, and she refused even to understand, I think, by the end, how wrong she was about debt falling as a percentage of GDP when it's going up. And when he himself actually said the NHS is 42 to 43 per cent of everything the government spends, when it's only 15 per cent. Can he just confirm one fact? These two years will see the biggest fall in living standards since records began. And that's why people are going to vote them out, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I've already explained uh, the Chief Secretary's comments. And in relation to my own, I was referring to current spending, um, not overall spending, and I clarified that as well. But look, there has been difficulties for so many millions of people across the country, and I've never sought to minimise that uh, from this position or any other position in the House, as the right honourable gentleman knows. But we have faced once in generation, once in hundred year challenges that this government has faced and taken the right action to deal with. Uh, cost of living support package over £100 billion to the tune of over £3,700 per person. We, are, we have dealt with these challenges and we've got a plan now to grow the economy, our way, grow our way out of them. And I'm afraid the members opposite in the front bench opposite does not have that sort of plan. And that's why I would not make the assumption that he makes about the election. Scott Benton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The number of those who are, are on long-term sickness benefits in Blackpool has increased fourfold over the last few decades. This represents an enormous loss of potential and is also hurting economic growth and productivity. The Government's proposed reforms in this area are to be welcome, but rather than delaying them until next year, what is preventing the Government bringing those in this year? Uh, I, I, will, uh, I will take that point away, but what I would say is, of course, the next financial year, I think, is what he's referring to. And indeed, at the next, at the next fiscal event, the budget, uh, the Chancellor will, will bear what he's said in mind. Where is it? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Fourteen <coughs> years of Conservatives' mismanagement of the economy are having disastrous impacts on working people. For example, Musicians are waiting months to be paid because HMRC is failing to produce A1 forms on time for musicians touring to Europe. The Trade Body Live told me that in one case 26 musicians, performers and sound engineers had not been paid over three months after their tour to Spain due to delays in processing A1 forms. Even worse, in response to written questions I have been told that service standards all these forms will not be met by HMRC until at least April 2024. Does this minister agree that these delays are totally unacceptable, particularly when our musicians are having to cope already with a challenging financial landscape, made worse now by news of a recession? <coughs> I thank the Honourable Lady for her point, and I, uh, I agree that we need to speed up the processing of A1 forms, as she has described, and I'm sure that uh, the Treasury has heard that, and indeed I'll make sure that my ministerial colleagues also take what she said very seriously indeed. Ms Savile Roberts. And whatever spin the Government puts on it, forecasts show that the, government, the economy has now officially entered recession, but the reality out there for people is that they've been suffering grinding economic pressure for years. Average energy bills are 59 per cent higher than they were in 2022, and over 600,000 Welsh households are in fuel poverty. Meanwhile, profits of energy companies such as British Gas have increased tenfold to £750 million. This is the Minister's chance to make a difference to every household. Talking about the next fiscal event, will he act to extend and bring back 
backdate even the windfall tax on energy companies which are presently profiteering from households everywhere. Here, here, here. The, the Honourable Lady is, is right that many people have, have had very challenging times over the last couple of years, but what I would say to her, and I would correct something I previously said to the House, Mr Speaker, is that the, the increase to real household income since 2010 is actually 8%, and the increase to GDP per capita is 12%. I want to put that on the record. And in relation to taxes, uh, I can't speculate about taxes at the next fiscal event. Mr. Speaker, the forecast says that uh, debt is going to be higher than it currently is in five years' time. Is that a reasonable time to be talking about tax cuts? And doing so, doesn't that suggest that the government learned nothing from the budget of September 2023-2022? I would assure the honourable gentleman that this chancellor uh, and this government is very different to the one in September uh, 2022 that he refers. And in relation to debt, I repeat the point that we are keeping to our fiscal rule, which is and has always been that debt will be falling in the fifth year of the forecast, falling once you exclude the Bank of England. That is, has always been our position, and it will continue to be the case. The Minister made no mention of the importance to the UK Treasury of North Sea oil and indeed the danger to the Scottish economy of the closure of Grangemouth Refinery. Given that the UK Treasury received £8 billion in revenues from the North Sea last year and is expected to receive £6.1 billion in revenues this year, can they not find the tens of millions, not tens of billions, that they'll get from revenue to ensure that the hydro cracker can be restarted and the profitability of the refinery increased threefold? Here, here. The honourable gentleman's specific point I will take away and we'll make, I'll make sure that the Treasury gets back to him. But the broader point about offshore uh, oil and gas in the North Sea is a very important one. It is absolutely critical that we support that sector. And it is absolutely critical that we, not just, by the way, for tax revenues, but for the livelihoods and prosperity of the United Kingdom. And indeed, this government stands full square behind the oil and gas sector. Debbie Abrahams. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there's overwhelming evidence that the lower the economic inequalities, uh, the higher economic growth is. Uh, but uh, we know from the ONS that between 2021 and 2022, the poorest fifth of households uh, had their disposable uh, income shrink by 3.4 per cent, while the richest fifth of households had their uh, disposable in uh, income increased by a corresponding 3.3 per cent. And this reflected the last 10 years uh, before that. So what assessment has the Minister or the Chancellor uh, undertaken to estimate the impacts of these increasing inequalities on our shrinking growth? In relation to people at the bottom end of the income scale, it's really important that since 20, the House knows that since 2010, people on full-time national living wage, which we're, which we're doing the biggest increase for, which will come in in April of this year, will be 30% better off than they were in 2010. Charlotte Nittles. Thank you, Mr Speaker. News that the UK is officially in recession comes as no surprise to my constituents in Warrington North, who have been battered by this Tory cost of living crisis. Food inflation is still double the headline rate of inflation, something that is not only affecting the price of the weekly shop, but having a hugely negative effect on my local pub and hospitality sector, with many businesses on the brink. Instead of the fantasy land spinning that everything is going fine, what measures will they actually bring in to bring food inflation down? Yeah. Inflation, and I've said it many times in this dispatch box this afternoon, is absolute target for this government to make sure we continue to bring it down and indeed in the coming months we expect it to get to two percent but in relation to food inflation specifically one thing that we are doing is by bringing in at the last fiscal event full expensing which will enable the manufacturers of food and supermarkets and others to invest to hugely increase their investment because it completely nets off against their tax so a hundred percent investment that gets nets off that gets netted off. The impact of that will be increased investment that will reduce their cost, that will reduce the cost of food in our shops. And so that's the sort of measure, uh, in, amongst many others, that's the sort of measure that we're putting in place to reduce food inflation. Matt Roldo. Thank you, Mr. 
Speaker. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister said he was going to grow the economy, and it, he's obviously failed. We're now in recession, and in my constituency, families and small businesses are under severe pressure. Can the Minister possibly explain what, how he's going to address these very serious problems? All I would say to the Honourable Gentleman is that we are in a very challenging international context. We have performed better than the international forecasters. We have higher, high inflation, which really bedeviled this economy a couple of years ago. We have brought down more, we have more than halved. And then we have a plan to grow our way out of it, as indeed shown by the last fiscal event, shown by the last fiscal event where we unveiled over 100, I think 110 growth measures. That is our plan. The Labour opposition doesn't have a plan, and we will see if, if this country sticks with our plan, we will grow our economy uh, significantly over the coming months and years. Patrick Rennie. He keeps trying to hide behind uh, the war in Ukraine and uh, the impact of the pandemic, but the reality is that those are affecting every country in the world. The exacerbating factor, the thing that has led most to economic decline, to massive labour shortages, excuse me, and to rampant inflation here in the UK, will he not admit, is Brexit. Uh, no, I would not, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dave Diana Johnson. Uh, the economy is in recession, and the consequences for the public finances are not the fault of those people like the infected and affected uh, through the uh, contaminated blood scandal, the largest treatment disaster in the NHS. So, can the Minister just confirm, as I was hoping to ask the Chancellor, whether money has already been ring fenced to pay compensation to those people? as set out in the final recommendations on compensation by Sir Brian Langstaff in April 2023. <coughs> I believe at the last Treasury questions, the Honourable Lady asked a similar question of the Chancellor, and the Chancellor responded by saying that he is absolutely clear about the need to compensate people in the way that uh, the Honourable Lady has described, and uh, he will update the House in due course, and indeed update her in due course, uh, further details in response to that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Prime Minister has absolutely failed to get growth, and industry has completely lost confidence in this government with projects cancelled, HS2 cancelled, uh, schools of the future cancelled, hospitals never built, and an absolute failure to bring down high energy prices. No wonder business investment forecast is down. So, with the US and EU incentivising investment, what is he now going to do to get the investment we need in the green manufacturing industries of the future? What we've done to increase investment, Mr Speaker, is by bringing in full expensing at the last fiscal event, which should represent an increase of £14 billion over the forecast period of investment, dealing with the chronic weakness of our economy over generations. So that's what we're going to do to increase investment. And in relation to uh, green investment in particular, what we are not doing is having a huge, unfunded £28 billion plan, or maybe now it isn't their plan, maybe it's a secret plan, or maybe they've, maybe they've stopped their plan, but the plan that the Labour front bench has. We have a responsible, costed plan to increase investment. They don't have one. In Wakeford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Let's try this again. Public sector net debt is set to rise from 89% of GDP this year to 92.8% of GDP in 2028-29. That's according to the most recent OBR forecast. Now, in case the Minister doesn't understand, that number is higher than today. Uh, so the Prime Minister promised to reduce debt. It's increasing. The plan isn't working, is it? What the Prime Minister is committed to doing, and indeed the whole government is committed to doing, is to reduce debt as we get to the end of this economic period, this forecast period, which is what we are doing. Just in matters. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do think the Minister's rosy picture of the economy shows a complete lack of awareness of what is actually going on in the country. And, and his claim that the Labour Party is somehow a risk to growth, and it's his own party that's just took the country into recession, shows a complete lack of self awareness as well. And that's the number of this. We are going into recession, and yet the Chancellor is nowhere to be seen. I would have thought this was important enough for him to be here today to answer questions. But my question to uh, the Minister is, given growing the economy is yet another pledge of the Prime Minister's that hasn't been met, who does he think should carry the can for this failure? Is it the Prime Minister or is it the Chancellor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> his criticism about my self-awareness, I'll just have to take on the chin, Mr. Speaker. But it, it, the broader point that, is, that he's making is a serious one, which is whether this me or this government somehow is light-hearted or thinks that everything is absolutely fantastic around the economy. It is not. That is why we've taken the measures that we have. That is why we are, redu we are cutting tax for working people beginning in January. That is why we're increasing business investment. That is why we had an over £100 billion cost of living support package, because we know how much many people in this, ordinary people, are suffering in this country. That is why we are trying to grow our economy overall, because that will result in higher prosperity for the country and more money for our public services. That's all put at risk, Mr Speaker, by the party opposite. Senator Davey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The government is failing. An 81-year-old constituent has said to me he can't ever remember the economy and living standards being this bad. Can the minister not see that under his government, Britain is worse off? I, I, I don't agree with the Honourable Lady. Uh, I won't repeat everything I just said uh, to the response to the last question, but I would say that under this government and this Treasury, there is a plan for growth that we are sticking to, and that is all put at risk with the party opposite. Richard Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Office for Budget Responsibility assessed Boris Johnson's trade and cooperation agreement at the beginning of last year. The trading relationship between the UK and the EU is set out in the TCA is said by the Office for Budget Responsibility to have reduced long-run productivity by 4%. Why does he think that is? Well, I, I, I would say to the honourable gentleman that the trade and cooperation agreement is something that we built on with the Windsor framework. It's something that the opposition doesn't propose to change and indeed is fundamental to our stability in relation with our relationship with the European Union, that I don't think at this time the country would, be, uh, would, be, would benefit from unpicking once again. Jim Shannon. Mr Speaker, can I thank the Minister very much for all of his answers? They weren't easy. Uh, the Office for National Statistics have revealed that there has been a 0.3 per cent decline in GDP between October and December last year. And given that the strength of the economy was and still is one of the Prime Minister's pleasure, uh, pledges, what steps is the Minister taking to reverse this decline and to reinstill confidence back in the government economic plans? The steps we are taking are, have, I've, I've already laid out um, in this session so far, but I will add one thing, which is to say that there is a critical need to make sure that all the regions of our country benefit from the steps that we are taking. It's one of the reasons why we've put so much effort and focus into investment zones over the last couple of years. We hope that these investment zones are going to continue to increase growth in the economy, but not just increase growth at a macro level, increase them for people in all of the regions of this country, particularly Northern Ireland uh, as, and other regions that have in the past maybe not benefited from the growth of this country. And it's something that regionally we are very committed to strengthening. That completes the urgent question. We now come to the statement on the Post Office, Secretary of State. With your permission, Mr Speaker, I wish to make a statement on post office governance and horizon compensation schemes. Mr Speaker, several serious allegations were made against the government, my department and its officials by Henry Staunton, the former chair of the post office, over the weekend. These allegations are completely false, and I would like to make a statement to the House so that honourable members and the British public know the truth about what, exactly what has happened. I would like to address three specific claims that Mr Staunton made in his Sunday Times interview, claims which are patently untrue. First, Mr Staunton alleges that I refused to apologise to him after he learnt of his dismissal from Sky News. That was not the case. In the call he referenced, I made it abundantly clear that I disapproved of the media breaking any aspect of this story. And out of respect for Henry Staunton's reputation, I went to great pains to make my concerns about his conduct private. In fact, in my interviews with the press, I repeatedly said 
that I refuse to carry out HR in public. That is why it is so disappointing that he's chosen to spread a series of falsehoods, provide made-up anecdotes to journalists, and leak discussions held in confidence. All of this merely confirms in my mind that I made the correct decision in dismissing him. Second, Mr Staunton claimed I told him that someone's got to take the rap for the Horizon scandal, and that was the reason for his dismissal. That was not the reason at all. I dismissed him because there were serious concerns about his behaviour as chair, including those raised from other directors on the board. My department found significant governance issues, for example, with the recruitment of a new senior independence director to the post office board. A public appointment process was underway, but Mr Staunton apparently wanted to bypass it, appointing someone from within the existing board without due process. He failed to properly consult the post office board on the proposal. He failed to hold the required nominations committee. Most importantly, he failed to consult the government as a shareholder, which the company was required to do. I know that honourable members will agree with me that such a cavalier approach to governance was the last thing we needed in the post office, given its historic failings. I should also inform the House that while he was in post, a formal investigation was launched into allegations made regarding Mr Staunton's conduct. This included serious matters such as bullying. Concerns were brought to my department's attention about Mr Staunton's willingness to cooperate with that investigation. So it is right that the British public know the facts behind this case and what was said in the phone call where I dismissed Mr Staunton. Officials from my department were on the line. It was minuted, and a readout was sent after it took place. Today, I am depositing a copy of that readout in both libraries of the House so the honourable members and the public can see the truth. Personal information relating to other post office employees in those minutes have been redacted. It is for all of these reasons that an interim chair will be appointed shortly, and I will, of course, update the House when we have further details. Finally, Mr Speaker, Mr Staunton claimed that when he was first appointed as chair of the post office, he was told by a senior civil servant to stall on paying compensation. There is no evidence whatsoever that this is true. In fact, on becoming post office chair, Mr Staunton received a letter from the Bayes Permanent Secretary, Sarah Mumby, on the 9th of December 2022. It welcomed him to his role, making it crystal clear that successfully reaching settlements with victims of the post office scandal should be one of his highest priorities. That letter is in the public domain. The words are there in black and white, and copies of the correspondence will be placed in the libraries of both houses. The reality is that my department has done everything it can to speed up compensation payments for victims. We've already made payments totalling £160 million across all three compensation schemes. That includes our announcement last autumn of the optional £600,000 fixed sum award for those who've been wrong wrongfully convicted. It's the strongest refutation, Mr Speaker, of those in this House who would claim that we only acted after the ITV drama, Mr Bates versus the Post Office. British people should know that a dedicated team of ministers and civil servants have been working around the clock for many months to hasten the pursuit of justice and bring swift, fair redress to all those affected. To that end, I am pleased that all 2,417 postmasters who claimed through the original Horizon shortfall scheme have now had offers of compensation, and the post office is dealing promptly with late applications and cases where the initial offer has not been accepted. My department has also established the Horizon Compensation Unit to ensure that money gets to the right people without a moment's delay. And we announced this autumn an additional £150 million to the post office specifically to help them meet the cost of participating in the post office Horizon inquiry and deliver compensation to postmasters. In all, we have committed around £1 billion to ensure wronged postmasters can be fully and fairly compensated. And we are taking unprecedented steps with the forthcoming legislation to quash convictions of postmasters affected by the Horizon scandal. In short, Mr Speaker, we are putting our money where our mouth is and our shoulders to the wheel in ensuring that justice is done. It is not fair on the victims of this scandal, which has already ruined so many lives and livelihoods, to claim, as Mr Staunton has done, that this is being dragged out a second longer than it ought to be. For Henry Staunton to suggest otherwise, for whatever personal motives, is a disgrace, and it risks damaging confidence in the compensation schemes which ministers and civil servants are working so hard to deliver. I would hope that most people reading the interview in yesterday's Sunday, Sunday Times would see it for what it was, a blatant attempt to seek revenge following dismissal. 
Mr. Speaker, I must say that I regret the way in which these events have unfolded. I did everything, we did everything we could to manage this dismissal in a dignified way for Mr. Staunton and others. However, I will not hesitate to defend myself and, more importantly, my officials who cannot respond directly to these baseless attacks. Right now, the Post Office's number one priority must be delivering compensation to postmasters who have not already been compensated. Those that fell victim to a faulty IT system they implemented and which they turned a blind eye to when brave whistleblowers like Alan Bates sounded the alarm. We said that the government would leave no stone unturned in uncovering the truth behind the Horizon scandal in pursuing justice for the victims and their families. We are delivering on that promise while looking for any further possible steps we can take so full and final settlement st uh, claims can be reached as quickly as possible. It is right that we f reflect too on the cultural practices at the post office which allowed the Horizon scandal to happen in the first place, a culture which let those in the highest ranks of the organisation arbitrarily dismiss the very real concerns of the sub-postmasters who are the lifeblood of their business and pillars of the local community. While the post office may have failed to stand by its postmasters in the past, we are ensuring that they do everything they can to champion them today, fostering an environment that respects their employees and respects their customers. That is how we will rebuild trust and ensure that the British Cup public can have confidence in our post office now and in the future. I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Yeah. Secretary of State, Jonathan Reynolds. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I firmly agree that the revelations in the Sunday Times at the weekend could not be more serious. In particular, the claim that the post office was instructed to deliberately go slow on compensation payments to some postmasters in order to push the financial liability into the next Parliament, if true, would be a further outrageous insult to a scandal that has already rocked faith in the fairness of the British state. It cannot be allowed to stand if it is the case, and if it is not, it must be shown to be false in no uncertain terms. Yet we do now have two completely contrasting accounts, one from the former chair of the post office and one from the secretary of state, and only one of these accounts can be the truth. And I hope we're all in agreement that Parliament is the correct place for these matters to be raised and clarified, because what we need now is transparency and scrutiny. So can I ask the Secretary of State, will she categorically state that the Post Office was at no point told to delay compensation payments by either an official or a minister from any government department? And at no point was it alluded to that a delay would be of benefit to the Treasury? Will there now be a Cabinet Office investigation to ensure that no such instruction or inference was given at any point. Crucially, is the £1 billion figure of compensation, which the Secretary of State quite helpfully just repeated, already allocated and sat in the Department of Business and Trade's accounts, ready to be paid? If it is not, will we see compensation payments itemised specifically in the upcoming budget? The Secretary of State will also understand that, following the story at the weekend, victims of other scandals, especially contaminated blood, now feel that they need to ask the question as to whether they have been the victims of deliberate inaction. Can the government provide assurances that no such obstruction has been placed on any payments of that kind? And if so, what is the delay with some of these cases? And in the full interests of transparency and to fully ascertain the veracity of any allegations for sub-postmasters and the general public, will she publish all relevant correspondence and minutes of meetings between the Department, the Treasury, UKGI, and the post office during this time? And finally, when can we expect the legislation on exonerations that was promised by the Prime Minister? I cannot stress enough how the last thing that was needed in this scandal was any further allegations of cover-ups or obfuscation at the very top of government. People's faith in government, already damaged from scandals like Hillsborough and Bloody Sunday and Windrush, is hanging by a thread. And this miscarriage of justice has shown the devastation that can occur when institutions are allowed to operate without oversight or are shrouded by secrecy. So we should all agree that that secrecy must end and the full sunlight of public scrutiny brought to bear. And if everything the Secretary of State has told us today is correct, surely there will be no objection to that happening in full. Yeah. Yeah. 
thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to very much uh, welcome the tone that the shadow front bench spokesman has taken on this. Mm -hmm. I know that there are often uh, tendencies for political point scoring, but I think we both agree that this is very much about the postmasters, and that is why I made sure that I was at this dispatch box so the people would know the truth. That is what builds. Um, that is what builds trust. So he asked if I would categorically state that no uh, instruction was given to uh, delay to delay payments. Yes, I can. We have no evidence whatsoever uh, that any official said this. And actually, if there, if if some, such such a thing was said, it is for Mr. Staunton himself to bring the evidence. It's yeah. very hard to refute a negative. People just making wild, baseless accusations and then demanding proof that they didn't happen um, are mischief-making, in, uh, in my view. So as far as I have seen, and all the evidence points to the fact that no one made this claim. But also, I think it's important to look at whether it would even make sense to do so. There would be no benefit whatsoever of us delaying compensation. Absolutely. This does not have any significant impact on revenues whatsoever. It would be a mad thing to even suggest. And the compensation scheme, uh, which uh, Mr. Staunton oversaw, has actually been completed. My understanding is that 100% of payments have been made, so clearly no instruction was given. And he mentions the infected blood inquiry. I think that this is a good example of how people lose faith in the system because of misinformation that is put out there. And that is why I am here to uh, correct the record. He asked about the billion pounds uh, allocation. We give monthly reports that show exactly what payments are being made. Mm -hmm. And um, he also asked about whether we would be publishing correspondence. Uh, no, we will not be publishing in full all correspondence between departments and uh, UKGI and the post office. That is because we set up the statutory inquiry that will examine those important issues relating to the Horizon scandal and examine current governance arrangements. So we are fully cooperating with the inquiry, but the inquiry is, was set up specifically to look at that by Parliament. Um, and in addition to the readout of the true content of my telephone call with Mr. Staunton, we will uh, consider publishing correspondence between departments and Mr. Staunton in accordance with freedom of information rules so that uh, people will know exactly what happened uh, contrary to the account that he has given. He asked about legislation. That is something we are actively working on, and I am expecting uh, that we will be able to do this imminently. Paul Scully. Thank you, Mr Speaker. When I was Postal Affairs Minister, the officials in my team didn't just share my drive to, uh, to get the money out of the door, the life-changing money for postmasters, but they actually were energised themselves, empowered to be able to do so. I cannot believe for a minute that just a few months later they would be doing and thinking the polar opposite, and they clearly cannot defend themselves in public. So can my right honourable friend confirm that these conversations did not happen about colluding to slow down the compensation, and it's really important that we double down and make sure we do get more money out of the door as soon as possible. Um, uh, first of all, I want to pay tribute to my right honourable friend for all the fantastic he uh, did as Postal Affairs Minister, and I can confirm that. My officials have looked through all of the correspondence, all of the minutes in the conversations that Mr. Sorton has had with the department. They have found absolutely nothing. And in the call that he had with me, he did not raise this. If this was something that officials had said to him, surely he would have mentioned it to ministers, either myself or the Postal Affairs Minister. The fact that he did not do so shows that this is quite likely something that he is making up. SNP spokesperson Marion Fellows. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm at a loss today. Another Monday, another post office scandal. And I don't, really, I, I, I've tried very hard to pull together my thoughts on what the statement says, what's been said in the Times, and what has also been said in this place only less than two weeks ago when I did a, a backbench business committee debate on culture and of post office management. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask uh, the Secretary of State. Uh, a couple of well, a few questions. Um, Secretary of State, can you place on the record whether or not Nick Reid wrote to the Justice Secretary last month defending uh, these convictions, saying that some of them were guilty? That's a really serious allegation, and I'd really like to have an answer. Will you also? Um, um, wait, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm waiting to see something coming through the door. I beg your pardon. Right. So now, there's been talk all morning about uh, damaging confidence in the, uh, the compensation schemes. If there is confidence 
in the compensation schemes. Can the Secretary of State explain to me why so many leading sub-postmasters who were affected by this scandal were given such derisory offers yeah. months and months and months late? Yeah. That, that's just not on. So you can't say that Henry Staunton damaged the, 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 the compensation schemes. That's government. That's Post Office Limited. Is the Secretary of State aware that there are still 40 employees who were, are still employed by Post Office Limited who were investigators who raised convictions? Madam Deputy Speaker, I know I haven't got much longer. Exoneration must be speeded up, and I agree with what the Honourable Gentleman, the Member of the Opposition, said. Exoneration must be hurried up. Compensation must be paid sooner rather than later. And I've said that every month, I think, for the last nine months. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, the Honourable Lady asks multiple questions. The first one uh, about a letter written by Nick Reed, the Post Office Chief Executive, to the Justice Secretary. Um, so what I can say is that UKGI and Post Office Limited have both vehemently denied that uh, Nick Reed was put under any pressure to write the letter that he is referring to. Um, and in terms of the risks about making a decision on blanket exoneration, uh, the Postal Affairs Minister has said uh, repeatedly that we have been faced with a dilemma, either accept the present problem of many people carrying the unjustified slur of conviction or accept that an unknown number of people who have genuinely stolen from their post office will be exonerated and perhaps even uh, compensated. So that is the case. That is certainly what the government believes. What she is saying about people being put under pressure to write uh, a letter, that is something that UKGI and Post Office Limited have both vehemently denied. Um, the Honourable Lady continues to uh, act as if or certainly repeats the uh, allegations that Mr Staunton has made. I have already given a statement that they are completely false. And uh, she asks about the uh, about individual cases of people who have been paid. I cannot comment on individual cases, but um, I would like to clarify that the main scheme that was in place under Henry Staunton's watch was the Horizon Shortfall Scheme. 2,417 cases uh, were made offers within the original deadline. So 100% had received offers, but 84% had accepted offers. I just want to clarify my previous, um, my previous comments. And in terms of the 40, uh, the 40 uh, prosecutors still working at the post office, that is something where I, I, I as Secretary of State, have had multiple people giving different uh, bits of information. That is something that the inquiry is looking at, and they will get to the bottom of it. So John Redwood. Will she review the governance of UKGI? How did they manage to preside over the post office with the dreadful treatment of the sub-postmasters? How did they allow the senior managers uh, of the post office to rack up and accumulate losses of £1,390 million, effectively bankrupting the post office so that it can now only trade if it has the reassurance of massive cash infusions from the Treasury on a continuing base. Surely this body has done very badly and we need a better answer. I thank my, uh, my right hon. Friend for his question. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we have been making personnel changes in this area. But uh, I think it goes back to the point which I was making in the statement, that the post office needs an effective chair. I did not have, until the day I had the conversation with him uh, dismissing him, I never had any correspondence from Mr Staunton about difficulties that he was having with UKGI. If he was having them, he should have told me, rather than give an interview to the Sunday Times, effectively stating that he had no control over the organisation which he'd been appointed to run. Kevin Jones. Speaker. The Secretary of State says that Henry Stoughton's accusations are completely false, therefore we've got to accept that. Um, the issue around the uh, letter that Nick Reid wrote to uh, the Chancellor, uh, the, uh, the uh, Lord Chancellor, uh, about over conviction mentioned the issue around 300 people possibly are going to be, in quote, guilty. Now, she just told the House that those people so that uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, investment uh, body uh, didn't instruct him to do that. Well, Henry Thornton said, Thornton said he didn't tell them to write that. The board didn't know about it. So who did? Uh, and can I ask that in the uh, openness and transparency that she should produce all of the correspondence between uh, UK uh, investments and the post office? And can I just say to her, she's accused Henry Thornton of lying uh, in public. 
Well, the only reason we can actually judge that she is telling the truth is that if we actually have all the information out there. And can I just say to also, from her uh, obsession with tweeting, when she says people are jumping on the bandwagon on this, some of us have been involved in this for many years, yeah. on a cross-party basis, yeah, yeah. working with yeah, people yeah. like her colleague, the member for uh, Malton, and uh, for, for, um, for Malton. And can I just say, that's quite insulting. But what her tone today will send to the sub-postmasters, I'll say this, it's more cover-up, more ossification, so get it out there, explain what's going on, and give the information, otherwise you will not have the trust, it's just more of the same we've seen over many, many years. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I completely reject the assertions that the Honourable Gentleman has made. And this is the political point scoring which I talked about earlier, which we, need to, which, which we just need to stop. He is in, rather than focus on the issue, he's talking about my tweeting. Um, I think maybe he should get off Twitter and actually listen to what I'm saying um, at the dispatch box. He is talking about, he is talking about uh, a letter which UKGI have said that they did not ask uh, uh, Nick Reid to write. So I think the question that he's, uh, the, the only possible answer is that Nick Reid himself decided to write that letter. I, I, I didn't ask him to write it. Post office say they didn't. UKGI didn't. And this is what, these are the sorts of things, just trying to continue to make aspersions on ministers. We have made the post office an independent body. We have an independent inquiry and the information will come out in due course. Sir Colin Burns. Speaker, there is no doubt that there was a bad culture in the post office for a very long time. They misled a significant number of ministers who, to put it yeah, gently, yeah. could have been yeah, yeah. more inquiring over the years. Can my right honourable friend tell us if she's had time to reflect on the words of the non-executive members of the board representing the postmasters who say that only days before she sacked the chairman that there was still a culture that they were guilty and that they were on the take. And if that sacking has brought the compensation to those people who were traumatised and misled by the post office, who had their lives destroyed, her decision will go down as being a very, very welcome one. Um, I thank my right honourable friend uh, for that question, and of course I am, I am going to agree with him, but I think it is very interesting, the comments that were made by the two uh, members of the board who were former post, uh, postmasters. They are saying exactly what I am saying, that Henry Staunton was not doing a good job as post office chair, which leads me back to the point made by uh, the honourable gentleman in his previous question. He is more interested in attacking the government than looking at what even the members of the board are saying. It is important that we continue to give confidence to people that these organisations are run properly, and that was the reason for the dismissal. Alistair Carmichael. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Whatever the reason for it, I can tell the Secretary of State having supported constituents in negotiation in relation to the historic shortfall scheme, that the conduct of the post office and of their agents in that was one which was characterised by delay and obstruction. That in turn led to a view taking hold among sub-postmasters that there was no point in making claims. Since the ITV drama was aired, I have heard of a number of constituents in my own area that have made claims belatedly. So what more is the government doing to ensure that everybody who is out there who may have a claim is actually going to be able to receive it? Uh uh, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. It is a good one. I think the fixed sum awards are showing that this is a matter that we are taking very seriously. I became Business Secretary in February of last year, and my one priority was to make sure that people got their compensation as quickly as possible. I did yeah. everything that I possibly could with uh, the Post Office Minister, the member for Thurston Moulton, who I really want to take uh, the opportunity to thank for his tireless efforts. Yeah. He had been uh, looking at the portfolio before I got the job as Business Secretary, and I knew knew that uh, the work was in safe hands. We have worked together as a team. We have fought uh, cross-departmentally to make sure that people got the compensation that they deserve. We brought legislation in uh, just before uh, December, well before the ITV drama. But the cases that he raises are really important to show that there is still a lot of work to do, and we will continue doing that. Duncan Baker. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, given the Post Office track record with accuracy, I am very glad that we have had the Secretary of State. I would rather take her assurances at the dispatch box than anything from a former disgruntled 
uh, sacked uh, employee of the post office. Uh, I, during this recess, I even had constituents coming to me still saying that they were affected by the Horizon scandal. So can you assure people that are watching out there, it is a very quick and simple process that people that still feel they lost money in that horrendous period do keep coming forward because there is a process that is easy to be able to fill in a form to make sure your voice is heard and you get that compensation. Um, uh, my honourable friend is quite right, um, and I want to thank him uh, for raising this and also for the work he did. I know that he was a former post of, uh, postmaster, so he knows quite a lot about uh, what has been going on. And uh, I do want to reassure uh, all of the people who have been affected by this scandal, this is something that we are taking very seriously. I was absolutely horrified when I became business secretary to see the, the sheer scale of trauma that people had been going through. We want people to continue coming forward, and where they're not happy, with the process, we will look again. But there is a formal process that is in place that makes sure that all the postmasters can be treated fairly, uh, equally, and equitably. Uh, Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, the allegations of limping towards the general election in terms of delaying um, compensation payments to postmasters does actually mirror the behaviour of government towards the infected blood scandal. Yeah. The government have had the final recommendations on that compensation since April 2023 with no action. So it seems to me that there is a pattern of behaviour. The government only seem to act when forced to or shamed to into taking any action. And it's clear with the infected blood scandal, we've been told uh, repeatedly by ministers that the government is working at pace. So actually what that really means is they're limping at pace, aren't they? <laughs> Uh, no, no, and no. And I think it's a shame that the Honourable Lady would stand up there and say that the government only acted when it was forced to. When she knows that we brought legislation to this House well before the ITV drama, she knows about the uh, Horizon shortfall scheme, she knows about the GLO payments, she knows about the overturned convictions. And the fact the fact that she is trying to mix this up with the infected blood uh, uh, inquiry, knowing, knowing that I have just proved that the allegations made by Minister Staunton are completely false, I have said that minutes will be put on the record show that this is not an issue which they want to look at beyond political point scoring. And I will not stand at this dispatch box and allow that to happen. Sarah Dines. Madam Deputy Speaker, leaks at the weekend to newspapers appear to show really poor embedded practices at the Post Office Board, using language about our postmasters as being on the take or guilty. What is my right honourable friend doing to clean up the act? Clean up the act. act. Uh, my honourable friend raises a very good point. This is why we need effective leadership at the post office. This is why I took the decision that I did to dismiss Mr Staunton, uh, amongst, other, uh, amongst the other allegations which, um, or, or the, the other issues which I've uh, put into this, uh, into this statement. We need people who care. And one of the problems, uh, that one of the things that worries me is that because Mr Staunton has decided to have a revenge in the papers, it's going to make it even harder for us to find people who will come in and do this very, very difficult job. And I hope that they will not be put off by the misinformation that has been in the papers. Andrew Bridgen. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Secretary of State for her prompt statement and her laying out her version of events around the dismissal of Mr Staunton, the Post Office Chairman, and we have to accept her statements from the dispatch board, but I have to take her exception to one point she's made. She said there was no evidence of stalling of compensation, but that evidence comes from the experience of my own constituents, Mr and Mrs Rudkin whose evidence to, uh, to, to me was actually fundamental in unravelling this whole Post Office Horizon scandal. Susan Rudkin's criminal conviction was overturned in the, one of the first nine in December 2020. When I spoke to Mr and Mrs Rudkin only a few weeks ago, they still have not received their compensation over three years after that criminal conviction was overturned. If that's not evidence of stalling, Madam Deputy Speaker, what is? <laughs> Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, what I would say is that I can't comment uh, because I don't have the details on that specific case, but a fixed sum award is available should they wish to take it. There is a process. We will move as quickly as he can. I can't speak specifically about why that delay is there, but we're doing everything we can to get the money out to the postmasters as quickly as possible. Richard Drax. Madam Deputy Speaker, I have a once proud former postmaster in my constituency who ran the post office in Swanage. 
He fell foul of this scandal and was sacked, not prosecuted. His life was utterly ruined and he repaid the money that he was owed. That was many, many years ago. His wife is now very, very ill. He still has not had compensation. May I make two points? One, his lawyer tells me the compensation scheme is taking too long. And secondly, because he wasn't prosecuted, can I uh, ask for the front bench's assurance that he won't be brushed off financially simply because he wasn't prosecuted? This man's life and his wife, his, their lives have been utterly ruined. Uh, I thank my honourable uh, friend for for that question. I, I know exactly the sort of people he will be talking about, and it is really uh, awful to hear everything that they have been through. I myself have a constituent who I've spoken to who's talked about how this scandal ruined her life. We owe it to them to do everything we can to make sure that they are fully compensated. I can assure him that ministers and officials are working every day. I know it isn't always as quick as people would like, but we want to make sure that it is done properly and that there are no issues uh, following that. I don't have the specific details of that case, but they can apply to the Horizon Shortfall Scheme, and if he brings it to the Postal Affairs Minister, we will look at it um, specifically. Kate Osborne. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Ministers have promised that the government will bring in a new law and to swiftly exonerate and compensate victims. So can the Secretary of State tell me why my constituent, Chris Head, has only been offered 13% of his compensation claim? How can sub-postmasters trust the government or the post office to deliver full and fair compensation when they're still facing so much pushback on their compensation claims and receiving offers that go nowhere near financial restoration, let alone compensation for the injustice. And if I can just quickly add, Madam Deputy Speaker, the suggestion by the Secretary of State that the government would have acted in the same way had the ITV drama not been shown is completely unbelieved or unbelievable by most, and none more so than the sub-postmasters themselves. Yeah. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the fact that in December we had brought legislation to the House Empty benches, all uh, opposite when that legislation uh, was brought through. Empty benches, they are the ones who have decided to take a more keen interest after the drama. We have been working flat out. I do not have the specific details of her constituent, as she knows, but I will continue to repeat what I have said, that where there are people who haven't received uh, compensation, we can look at it. There is a process. There is also an independent panel that they can appeal to, but the vast majority of people who have been getting offers are taking them. Brendan Clark Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, too often Quango bosses are rewarded for failure and able to walk away with big payouts. And it would be a disgrace for the man who has done so little to get compensation for postmasters to get any himself. So could the Secretary of State confirm that she will block any such payments? There will be no payments to Henry Staunton. Sammy Wilson. Uh, public squabble at the weekend, I think, further undermines the confidence which people have in uh, what's going to happen and the government's uh, assurances to, uh, to compensate the post office, uh, 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 um, uh, people who are affected. Um, I, I tend to believe the, the view of the Minister, simply because the record of post office officials of cover-up and of passing the buck and of trying to cause confusion has, is on record. We know what they're, they're, they're doing. But the fact remains there are still people who have not had any offer of compensation. Yeah. There's still a billion pounds which has not been spent and in giving compensation. There are still people who haven't um, even had their cases considered is the best way of answering Henry Staunton, not for the government to get on with the job and to make sure that compensation is paid quickly and that people uh, uh, get the compensation they deserve. Yes, the honourable gentleman is quite right. And 64%, uh, the, the number I gave earlier, 64% of people have received. We know that we want to get it to 100% as quickly as possible, but we want to make sure that people get the right amount, they're compensated fairly. And that's why we have the process, including uh, a point of appeal if they're unhappy with the offer. But the point he made right at the beginning of his question is correct. 
that people do uh, find th th this does undermine this, the, uh, the the points made in the newspapers do undermine what the work that we are doing. It was very disappointing to read those statements. It was also disappointing because I'd done everything I could to try and keep this out of the news uh, and do, do it uh, behind closed doors properly. I made sure when I gave minister, uh, you know, public statements that I said I wouldn't do HR in public. I even when I found out they had been leaked to Sky News called Sky News and asked them, my, one of my uh, assistants did, to ask them not to put that out in public domain before I had a chance to speak to Henry Staunton. Did the same with the Daily Mail, who thankfully did listen. But we also need the media to help us in this and not publish false allegations. Lee Anderson. Thank you, Madam Mr. Speaker. Nalan, I am absolutely staggered that the Labour Party now seem to be coming out in support of the disgraced post office management team. <laughs> this, by the way, this, by the way, Madam Mr. Speaker, is the same management team that oversaw the wrongful uh, imprisonment of, of, of constituents of postmasters across the country, hundreds of convictions. So, does my right or more friend agree with me that when, when push comes to shove, that that lot over there would take the side of the grifters, not the grafters? Um, I thank my honourable friend for his question. And uh, this is one of the reasons, as he said, that, uh, where the post office leadership had uh, overseen the wrongful convictions. We have had multiple changes, and this is just the latest to ensure that we get the right, uh, the right leadership in place. But as we can see, I know that some of, the, uh, from some of the members opposite are dealing with this properly. But from the heckling, we can see that for a lot of them, they came here thinking that they could get political points scored, and I am not allowing that to happen. So Chris Bryant. A, a, a lot of members are, of course, um, angry and impatient about trying to get compensation and exoneration for all the postmasters mm -hmm. as soon as possible. And if we're all honest, as Parliament, we should have been much more impatient much earlier yeah. as a whole. And there are some, some rare exceptions, including the, my honourable friend who's spoken earlier and, and obviously members on the other side of the House as well. Um, but can I just clarify something about the process of his dismissal? Um, as I understand it... Um, he, he found out about it from Sky News. I think the Secretary of State just added a piece of information, which is that she then rang Sky News before ringing him, I think, to try and get them to stop running it. So she knew that this had already been leaked to Sky News from somebody in her department, presumably. Um, what, what investigation did she go through to find out who that was um, that leaked it? Has that, is that person still in post? Um, because otherwise, one might just worry that it might have been she herself who leaked it. Um, I, I knew, I knew that someone, I knew that someone would uh, would ask that question. I have, in fact, evidence to show that I asked Sky News not to run the story. Of course I didn't leak it, because if I had, it would have created, it would have created legal risk if he found out on the news before, if he found out on the news before I had had a chance, to, uh, a chance to speak to him. We have no idea how Sky News found out the information. There are several thousand people who work at the Department for Business and Trade. There are many more who work at the post office at UKGI. The honourable member is heckling. But the point I am making is that leaks are incredibly damaging and harmful. They create legal risk for the department. I did not do so. I made multiple efforts with at least two media uh, outlets to make sure that they did not create problems for Mr Staunton. And it is one of the reasons why it is very disappointing to see what he did in the Sunday Times at the weekend. Debbie Abrams. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. To be honest, I I'm afraid I don't think the Business Secretary uh, and her statement has, has helped us to get closer to what the... Uh, the, the truth is in this uh, situation, it is a question of the Secretary of State's um, version of events and the former Chairman's version of events. So would, um, for clarity um, and to try and draw a line under this and to get to the truth, would the Secretary of State be willing to refer herself to the Ethics Advisor? I think that that is a ridiculous assertion from someone who clearly was not listening to the statement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The difference between what I'm saying and what Mr Staunton is saying is that I have officials who will back me up. I have members of the advisory of, of the post office board who will back me up. I have uh, newspaper uh, and media uh, outlets who will know that I tried to stop the story. The fact is, she just wants to believe Mr Staunton's allegations because yeah, yeah, yeah. that helps them politically, but they are not true. They need to listen to the truth and stop hoping for lies. That is not what our job is in this House. Uh, Clive Beckett. Deputy Speaker, 
If Henry Staunton is uh, guilty of what the Secretary of State has accused him of, it does beg his belief that he was only appointed two years ago by yes. this government. Yes. But, but uh, can I ask her about post office investigations? Because I've got yet another constituent who's come forward who's forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement by the post office who hasn't been fully compensated for what they lost when they lost their business. Is it, is it acceptable for the post office to be involved with investigations still, given how discredited they are? How can the victims of this scandal have any confidence in the process that the post office is involved with in any way whatsoever? Uh, I think that the way that we have been dealing with this issue at the dispatch box, the work that the inquiry is, ca uh, is carrying out, and our commitment to look at individual cases and make sure that the process is working out properly is how uh, the postmasters will have confidence in the system. Uh, ben Lake. In recent weeks, I've met with a number of constituents, former uh, postmasters, who have explained the terrible impact this scandal has had on their lives. Although they weren't actually convicted by the post office, they did have to pay large sums of money to pay for shortfalls that, quite frankly, didn't exist. Um, I'd be very grateful if the Secretary of State could confirm that it is the government's expectation that they are not only compensated for the money that they paid, but also for the financial and personal harm that this scandal caused their lives. This is definitely what we're trying to do. No one should be in a worse position than they were before this scandal happened. And where we can provide additional compensation, we will be able to do so. And that's what the process is set out to do. Stella Creasy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Sticker. I mean, I think many of us would be concerned about the department that oversees employment rights being one where thousands of people know somebody's about to be sacked before they do. <laughs> but we would agree with the Secretary of State when she says this is really about giving the public confidence that when wrongs come to light, they will be righted. And the challenge that she faces here is the track record of recent decades is not good. It's not just about the Horizon scandal. It's about the nuclear veterans, Windrush, the WASPy women, the infected blood scandal, Grenfell. Time and time again, it's the compensation schemes themselves that become the story and a source of injustice. So rather than taking to Twitter, isn't the right rejoinder on this to become the first Secretary of State to say, actually, we should put out to an independent body management of compensation schemes involving government so that everybody could have confidence? I'm sure she would find support on this bench for that. Uh, first of all, I haven't said that thousands of people knew that Henry Staunton was being sacked. I said there are thousands of people who work in the department, and it could have been anybody who put that out there. Again, it's really important that we stick to what is, uh, what's been said on the record. She mentions that these are scandals that have been going over decades. I would like to remind her that the Horizon scandal happened and started under a Labour government. It is this government that is beginning to fix it. Uh, Barbara Keeley. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I want to raise with the Secretary of State the shortcomings of the Horizon Shortfall Scheme. My constituent, Mr Pennington, was a sub-postmaster for 20 years, and he has raised issues about those shortcomings after he went through 10 years of financial distress, paying back shortfall amounts demanded by the errors generated by the Horizon system. The poorly designed Horizon Shortfall Scheme has paid back only part of the shortfall, which is possibly £100,000 has only paid back part of that, and only a paltry £1,500 for 10 years of financial stress and worry. I wrote to the Minister responsible four weeks ago and I haven't had a response. When will the shortcomings of this scheme, the Horizon Scheme, be reviewed so that sub-postmasters like Mr Pennington receive full, not part, compensation for all those years of distress? Uh, Ms. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Lady has rights to raise that. We are aware of this problem. Uh, this is something that we are working with the advisory board to see how we can fix and make sure people get proper compensation. And um, I've just been told by the uh, Post, uh, Postal Affairs Minister that the letter which she's expecting should be with her shortly. Florence Hashalomi. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thank the Secretary of State for her statement. Um, she will be aware that many post office branches have closed in recent years, including the Clapham Common Post Office in my constituency, which is due to close on the 6th of March. In her statement, the Secretary of State said that right now the post office's number one priority is delivering compensation to the postmasters. Does she agree with me? that millions of pounds spent on the post office trying to pay the submasters, innocent submasters, should have been better spent on actually making sure we keep our vital post offices up and down the country. 
I would like to thank the Honourable Lady for her tireless work uh, campaigning to save the uh, Clapham Post Office. I know she's had many meetings with the Postal Affairs Minister. I think that we should be able to do both. We should be able to keep post offices uh, open as well as compensate. Sorry. Uh, thank you. As this is a genuine national scandal, it's important that sub-postmasters with criminal convictions in terms of exoneration are treated equally with a shared, speedy, uh, common approach across uh, the UK. Uh, both I and the recently reappointed Justice Minister in Northern Ireland have written to ministers asking for Northern Ireland to be included in forthcoming legislation. However, I understand that the government is currently not minded to do so in terms of the devolved administrations. Uh, can I ask uh, the, the Secretary of State to, to confirm that Northern Ireland will be part of that, that legislation, which, which hopefully will be brought forward soon. Um, uh, the I thank the Honourable General for his question. He will know that uh, Stormont is now up and running, and there are conversations which we will be having with the Vol government on the best way to resolve this. We don't have an answer now, but we are aware of this issue and we're working on it. Jones. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The reports on the weekend were extremely uh, alarming, given the way that the postmasters have been treated in recent years. The obvious question, though, is could the, the Secretary of State give any assurance or guarantee that, that the compensation will be repaid and that those, uh, the, the um, compensation taken forward before at the general election is called? That surely is the very basic that some postmasters would ask uh, and the very least that they deserve. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's absolutely the right thing to do, and I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question because it gives me another opportunity to just to restate that the very idea that compensation would be delayed till after the election is a complete nonsense. It doesn't even make political sense. We want to make sure people get their money as quickly as possible. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Secretary of State very much for our, our very uh, positive answers. Uh, Secretary said, across the United Kingdom, Great Britain and Northern Ireland, there are hundreds of postmasters and postmistresses are still awaiting compensation for these wrongdoings. Whilst it is understood that this is a very sensitive subject for money, can the Secretary of State provide an update to the timescale or just when the Secretary of State expects everyone entitled to be compensated, especially for all constituents across the United Kingdom, Great Britain and Northern Ireland? The fact of the matter is, some people wait two years, three years and longer. It just really can't go on. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, the honourable member is, uh, gentleman is right. It can't go on. I want to see everyone get their money as quickly as possible. Uh, by the end of this year, everybody should have received their funding. That's certainly what I'm working towards. I thank the uh, Secretary of State for her statement. And we now come to. I'll just let the personnel change. Minister Leo Doherty. Madam Deputy Speaker, with permission, I would like to update the House on the death of Alexei Navalny. I am sure I speak for the whole House in sending our deepest condolences to Mr Navalny's family, friends and supporters. We are appalled at the news of his death. Mr Navalny dedicated his life with great bravery to exposing corruption. He called for free and fair politics and held the Kremlin to account. He was an inspiration to millions, and many Russians felt that he gave them a voice. The Russian authorities saw him as a threat. President Putin feared to even speak his name. Putin's Russia imprisoned him on fabricated charges, poisoned him, and sent him to an Arctic penal colony. Mr. Navalny was a man of huge courage and iron will. Even from his remote prison cell, he persisted in advocating for the rights of the Russian people. No one should doubt the dreadful nature of the Russian system. Years of mistreatment at the hands of the state had a serious effect on Mr Navalny's health. His death must be investigated fully and transparently. The Russian authorities must urgently confirm the location of Mr Navalny's body to his family and allow them access to it. On Friday, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office summoned the Russian ambassador to express our outrage at Mr Navalny's death. We made clear that we hold the Russian authorities fully responsible. As the Foreign Secretary said over the weekend, those responsible must be held to account. And I can assure the House that we are working at pace to explore all options. As a mark of respect, the Foreign Secretary and his G7 counterparts began their meeting on Saturday with a minute's silence in honour of Mr Navalny. 
Our ambassador in Moscow laid flowers at the memorial to victims of political repression on Saturday. The ideals for which Mr Navalny stood and died will live forever, and I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Uh, Shadow Minister Stephen Doughty. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister for advance sight of his statement. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, this weekend my right honourable friends, the Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Foreign Secretary attended the Munich Security Conference and heard Yulia Navalnaya, Alex Navalny's wife, speaking with remarkable courage and conviction in a moment of utter personal grief. And I share the comments of the Minister, and I'm sure the whole House will join us all in sending our deepest condolences to her and her family. The death of Alexei Navalny was shocking and yet cruelly predictable, because let us be crystal clear, one person bears the overwhelming responsibility for his death, one person above all others should be held accountable. Alexei Navalny is yet another victim of the oppressive system that Putin has built, the system of which he was such a potent critic. He was not a saint, but he fought relentlessly, optimistically and with good humour against the corruption and hypocrisy of modern Russia, and indeed the last few years of his life were a profile in courage. After an assassination attempt with a chemical weapon, there would have been no shame at all in seeking a quiet life, but instead he chose not just to return to the fray, but to return to Russia, and he knew exactly what he would face. But Alexei Navalny believed relentlessly, indefatigably, in a different Russia, a Russia that could be, in his words, not only free, but happy. Everything will be all right, he once wrote from prison. And even if it isn't, we will have the consolation of having lived honest lives. Alexei Navalny's courage, his campaign against corruption, and his dream of a democratic Russia will live on in those brave Russians who continue to speak up. We know that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is an illegal act of aggression. Navalny called it a stupid war built on lies. It's been devastating for Ukraine, but also for Russia, which edges further into darkness, propaganda and paranoia. Alexei Navalny, of course, challenged not just Russian autocracy and kleptocracy, he also challenged past Western hypocrisy and enablements, and his campaign was not just about Moscow, but also London. We must deliver the changes he campaigned for. The reality is we have still much further to go, and it's therefore very disappointing that the Minister has shown up with nothing new to say in response to last week's appalling news. And I want to therefore ask him, will the Government review further sanctions on Russia, including an assessment of the full Navalny list? Will he launch a new effort to target those networks that are responsible for facilitating and enabling international corruption? Little or no action on breaches of new Russian sanctions brought in since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine has happened. So will he not strengthen not just our sanctions regime, but how those sanctions are enforced? Will he support calls to establish an international anti-corruption court? And will he turn rhetoric on frozen Russian state assets into tangible action? When will the government get on with it? It's a source of shame, Madam Deputy Speaker, that under successive Tory governments, Britain became the money laundering capital of the world. And our tributes to Alexei Navalny must be more than just rhetorical and include tangible action at home to clean up the financial crime fueling autocrats abroad. Finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to ask the Minister about Vladimir Karamoza. I've met his brave wife and mother personally and heard directly from them. Vladimir is another brave and vocal opponent of Putin, languishing in prison for his beliefs. He's also a British citizen. We know what Putin is capable of. So can I ask the Minister what the FCDO's current assessment of his welfare is and what steps are being taken to support him and his family? The tragic death of Alexei Navalny has reverberated across the world. It must serve as a reminder of Putin's menace and underscore our responsibility to oppose him in Ukraine, on the world stage and indeed here in London. And I hope that the Minister can provide the House with some assurance that today's statement will be accompanied with commensurate, bold and urgent action. Yeah. Well, Madam Deputy Zika, we, we will act, but I, can I say, uh, firstly, uh, can I express my thanks uh, to the Honourable Gentleman for, for the tone uh, of, of his response. And I join him in uh, uh, endorsing everything he said about the heroically brave uh, Mrs Navalny. Uh, those in this House who watched her video earlier this morning will have been extremely moved uh, by her fortitude and courage in this extremely difficult time. 
Uh, and he used the word courage in, with, with, with uh, regards to uh, Mr Navalny, which was uh, absolutely appropriate. Those of us who watched the footage of uh, Mr Navalny returning to Russia, subsequent to the, the Novichok attack, uh, uh, were humbled by his uh, audacity and his bravery. And uh, his hope for a free and happy Russia is something that we must ensure that can remain in the hearts of the many Russians who, despite the uh, extraordinary levels of uh, press censorship and repression, uh, deserve to have that uh, uh, promise, the opportunity to live up to that promise. Um, it would be premature, Madam Deputy, if we comment on uh, the prospect of future sanctions, uh, in addition to the uh, sanctions that have already been put in place with regard to his uh, poisoning. Uh, but I can assure the Honourable Gentleman and the House that we are working at pace uh, and looking at all options in that regard. Uh, of course, we will continue our very active uh, diplomatic work to uh, uh, crack down on networks of corruption surrounding uh, the Russian uh, state and its kleptocracy. Uh, and as a part of that, sanctions evasion is a particularly important uh, component in uh, some of our diplomatic teams around the world uh, in, allies, uh, in concert with our allies are, are very much focused on. Uh, he asked a relevant question about uh, uh, seizing versus freezing assets. We, are, well, we continue to work with G7 allies and looking to, to look at all legal routes to ensuring that assets that are uh, frozen might be used to help the reconstruction effort uh, by, the, by the, those who deserve them, uh, and uh, we will keep the House updated as and when we make progress on that. But we do seek uh, to act in this regard, and that is how we can honour Mr Navalny's uh, memory and his legacy, by acting, not just uh, making rhetorical statements. He asked about Mr Vladimir Karamurza. Uh, through our ambassador in Moscow, we continue to make representations inquiring after his health and well-being and seeking uh, consular access to him. And uh, I can confirm that the Foreign Secretary is, remains in contact uh, uh, with, uh, with Mrs. Karen Mirza and continues to support the family. Chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Alicia Kearns. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Alexei Navalny was murdered. And it is important that we in this House call it out for what it was, because that is what he deserves. Following his murder, I was also in Munich, where I heard his wife, Yulia, ask for us to stand by her. That is what we must now do. The US threatened over a year ago that there would be significant repercussions if Navalny was murdered. Biden must now deliver on that threat or we will see more lives taken, such as that of Vladimir Karamurza. In addition, will my right honourable friend and I reiterate the calls for the seizing of central bank assets? I would make the point that that was done before the UN Security Council froze and seized Iraqi assets. So we have a precedent. There is no reason for us to find new legislation or other ways to do so. But beyond that, we do need to pursue a special tribunal on the crime of aggression. Will we consider also sanctioning Russia's deposit insurance agency? And finally, to hit the heart of Putin's economy, will we urge the US to release more oil and therefore drive down prices? Well, Madam Deputy, I'm very grateful to the Honourable uh, Lady uh, who, who speaks with authority and I'm grateful for her reflections on her meeting in Munich. Uh, she's right to use the word uh, murder. Uh, we, we do seek to hold uh, the, the state and uh, the Russian leadership uh, to account. Uh, of course, I can't comment on the American position, but with regard to uh, our policy with regard to uh, Russian state assets, we will continue to look at uh, the appropriate legal path to ensuring that that which is frozen might be utilised uh, to bring benefit um, to those affected by this outrageous and illegal war in Ukraine. Uh, uh, in terms of accountability, a special tribunal is one of the things that we are considering, uh, uh, together with uh, our Ukrainian allies and Sir Howard Morrison, and there's been a, a large degree of institutional work together uh, with uh, Ukrainians and the G7 uh, uh, group uh, in regard to that. So we will continue to find the best mechanism possible uh, that might sit alongside the ICC, uh, which has already, of course, indicted uh, Putin, uh, which, uh, and, and that indictment for uh, uh, crimes with relation to uh, trafficking children did have an impact on his travel plan. So it does, the, sometimes the, the cogs of justice can turn slowly, but they do turn surely. surely. She mentioned uh, a good point about the insurance agency. I can't comment on that now. And she also asked about uh, the flows of oil, which, uh, again, I can't make, make any comment, but we are uh, 
focused in a laser-like way on the economic impact of our sanctions in the round. And I should say that this House should have confidence that when you take our actions uh, uh, as part of the G7 response, the economic impact and the, and the extent to which G7 and uh, international actions uh, in terms of sanctions, the way that they have impact the ability for Putin to fund his war, have been very, very significant to the tune of billions. Uh, SOP spokesperson Alan Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. We are all of us appalled at this murder and the timing of it. It was designed to send a message and it needs a serious response. And I'm grateful for sight of the statement as far as it goes. And I think the Minister would acknowledge that it doesn't go very far. So I would press for further action. Uh, the Minister will be aware that the EU Foreign Affairs Council is meeting in Brussels as we speak and they're looking at a range of measures as well. So can the Minister assure us that the UK will be part of those efforts? Uh, particularly with regard to the implementation of Magnitsky sanctions. I'm not looking for an announcement now, but making sure that we are coordinated with that. Also, I'd reiterate my own calls for the sequestration of the Russian assets that have been seized. This death, this murder, was designed to send a message. A serious message must be the response to it, and if there is one, it will have SNP support. Thank you. I'm grateful as ever to the uh, uh, SNP spokesperson for his uh, tone and his support. Of course, it would be premature for me to comment on, and uh, we never comment uh, by convention on sanctions from the dispatch box, but of course we are looking at pace at all options in response to this uh, outrageous event. And of course, in, in, in that context, uh, we will continue to liaise with US and uh, EU allies. Uh, that's a matter of course. Uh, he, he asked a good question about sequestration. Uh, again, I can't comment other than to say that we, are, we continue to look at the most viable legal route to bring about that good. Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg. Madam Deputy Speaker, could my honourable friend tell the House what advantages remain in maintaining diplomatic relations with this murderous and barbarous regime? The benefit, Madam Deputy Speaker, is in order to deliver messages of uh, condemnation and outrage and to continue to advocate uh, for consular access to those uh, held by the uh, Russian regime. Hey, Margaret Hodge. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I want to turn to the economic impact of the sanctions, uh, uh, which the Minister alluded to. A loophole in our sanctions regime means that countries like China and India import Russian crude oil, process it, and then sell it into the UK as refined oil. In 2023, we imported 5.2 million barrels of this oil. And that means that we sent something like £141 million pounds in tax revenue into Kremlin's war chest. Britain is also the biggest insurer of Russian oil moved by sea, most of which is sold at prices well above the price cap, again violating sanctions. Does the Minister agree that tough words are no substitute for tough actions, especially after the shocking murder of the heroic Alexei Navalny? Will he agree to report back to Parliament before Easter with proposals to stop the sanctions busting? Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, we, we should have confidence that the economic impact of sanctions has been very significant. Putin has been denied uh, hundreds of billions of dollars because of the collective action of uh, G7 uh, nations. Uh, is it perfect? No, it's not. Are we looking at ways of making it more effective? Yes, we are. And will we keep the House updated? Of course. Barry Selwood. Uh, uh, speech at the Munich Security Conference changed the tone of that entire summit. She called for the West to act. Would the Minister agree with me that uh, Navalny's death underlines Putin's determination to emulate Stalin, to quash free voice of speech in Russia, but also to extend Russia's influence beyond its own borders. Could I ask whether, the, we, when we speak of sanctions, we might also consider pressing the Americans to expedite that $60 billion that Ukraine needs? Because one way we can honour Navalny's life is by making sure Ukraine wins and Russia loses. And to that extent, could I also suggest that while diplomatic back channels need to remain open, maybe it's time to dismiss the Russian ambassador? Madam Deputy Speaker, we will continue to lead by example in terms of our provision of lethal aid and humanitarian aid, and of course we hope and expect that our closest allies will 
uh, do the same. The impact of our provision has been very, very significant. He made a very good point about uh, Putin, Putin's leadership. I think what this event shows actually is the fact that Putin is fearful, fearful of those who have the courage, like Mr. Navalny, to challenge him and speak truth to power, because that's the most, uh, that is the most uh, uh, potent uh, action in the face of uh, a cruel, repressive, uh, tyrannical regime uh, like Mr. Putin's, which ultimately is quite brittle. Richard Ford. At the end of February last year, Alexei Navalny clarified his position on Crimea. He talked about how the borders of Ukraine and of Russia were internationally recognised and were defined in 1991. Does the Minister agree that, while it's not our position or, or our place to choose the government of Russia, um, we do long for a time when Russia is governed by a government that respects sovereignty and territorial integrity? Yeah, yeah. Honourable gentlemen, and there is no inevitability about uh, the Russian people being ruled by a tyrannical tyrant, uh, 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 a latter day Tsar. There's no inevitability about that. And then Mr. Navalny, Mr. Navalny knew that, and that's why his messages and his brilliantly produced and humorous videos were watched by millions of people in Russia, because many millions of Russian people seek that alternative. Henry Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is clear that domestically the Putin regime is a criminal racket and, of course, internationally uh, has brought war against Ukraine and threatens many others. What discussions and diplomatic efforts is the UK government making with other NATO members who don't pay the minimum 2% GDP towards our common defence? Very good question, and we, and we continue to make that point very, uh, in a very full-throated way to our NATO allies, which is, as he knows, a growing organisation uh, with uh, a growing potency and capability, uh, but we collectively must and will put our money where our mouth is. Stephen Kinnett. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I declare an interest. I was Director of the British Council in St Petersburg from 2005 to 2008, and also I'm honoured to call Vladimir Karamurza my friend. Uh, I met him shortly before he insisted on flying back to Russia, and in spite of many of us urging him not to do that, it's a measure of the man that he, he did that, and, and indeed we're talking about somebody who the Russian authorities have tried to poison twice. So similar to the heroism of uh, Navalny, Karamurza has stood up against the mafia state that is represented by Vladimir Putin. Uh, the question I'd like to ask the minister is, he has said, and it was good to hear that the, our ambassador in Moscow is doing his best to get access to Karamurza. Um, could I press him on this issue around his medical condition? He is weakened by the two attempts at his poisoning, uh, and we are desperately worried uh, that he may well be uh, on, on the list in terms of what uh, the, the Kremlin may be wanting to do next. And, and his medical health is of the utmost importance. Could, so could the Minister please say what steps are being taken specifically to ensure that Mr Kalamutsa's health is being looked after? Grateful to the, the Honourable Gentleman, and, I'm great, and, he, knows, and he, was, he, he, he knows from his own experience the system that uh, we are dealing with. In direct answer to his question, uh, we continue to make representations at the very highest level into the senior membership the leadership of the Russia state that we expect Mr Karamurza's health to be attended to and to him to, for him to receive uh, medical care and for no threat to be made to his life. That, that, that message is carried by our ambassador to, directly to Russian government ministers and of course in, it, in addition to that uh, uh, ministers and the Foreign Secretary continue to engage with Mrs Karamurza to offer their family full support. So John Whittingale. Um, does my honourable friend agree that the murder of Alexander uh, Navalny following the murder earlier of Boris Nemtsov mm. shows the absolute refusal of Putin to tolerate any kind of genuine democratic opposition? Yeah. And will the government therefore give absolutely no credibility or recognition to the sham pretense that the so-called presidential election taking place hear, next hear. month in Russia undoubtedly will be? Hear, hear. Indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker, he speaks from a position of knowledge, and he's absolutely right about the, the, sh the forthcoming sham elections on the 12th of uh, March. Uh, the, 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 the murders of which he speaks um, 
uh, do show a terrible pattern. And, but as, as I said previously, we should not feel that there is inevit uh, any inevitability about uh, repression, rep rep repressive government being an inevitability in Russia. Um, the Russian people uh, do have a hope that there can be a different uh, government, and that's why Mr Navalny's message uh, was received so well. Joanna Cherry. Speaker, all those who care about democracy and free speech should condemn the murder of Alexander Navalny. But one of the most meaningful things the United Kingdom government could do to honour his memory is to take steps to deal effectively with the dirty Russian money being laundered in this country, particularly as it's money coming that's been made through nefarious means by allies of, of Putin. So could the government address that question? What are they going to do to deal more effectively with the dirty Russian money being laundered in the United Kingdom? The House should have confidence and should be proud of the fact that we have sanctioned more than 1,900 individuals and entities. There is, no, there is no space or place for dirty Russian money in the United Kingdom. Bob Seeley. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I just want to reinforce the point about Vladimir Karamazov. He's a British citizen. He's now the most high-profile political prisoner in Russia. In my conversations with the minister and with his officials, when I've talked about prisoner swaps, which I was doing at the behest of the Navalny team, um, it was made quite clear that to do that encourages state hostage-taking. I accept that argument, as difficult as it is. Unfortunately, it comes at a price. In my conversations with Yevgenia Karamazov, she is adamant that she wants everything now done, if possible, to get Vladimir out despite the fact that he went back of his own accord because his health is in a fragile condition and if Putin can kill Navalny he can kill Karamurza. There is some criticism that the government has not done everything possible in the past. Will he reassure me that every conceivable course of action to get Karamurza out, potentially including you know, negotiated swaps with you know, Russian spies in Sweden or wherever, every option will be looked at because otherwise he'll be next. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, as, he's, as the Honourable Gentleman said himself, we, we do not and would not countenance a, a policy of prison swaps. Um, but of course, uh, we continue to make every effort to support Mrs. Karamurza and to seek uh, the release of, of Vladimir. Uh, Neil Hanley. Speaker, holding political prisoners is not a sign of strength, it's a sign of weakness yeah. and uh, Mr Navalny's death and murder should be rightly condemned. However, right now in the UK, journalist Julian Assange is in Belmarsh Prison uh, for blowing the whistle on atrocities in Iraq. Does the Minister agree that it is important for the UK Government to measure itself against the same standards if it's going to criticise others? Well, I think, I think the Honourable General can sense that the House knows there is no equivalence. David Jones. Madam Deputy Speaker, in 2020, uh, Alexei Navalny was treated in hospital in Berlin, having been poisoned in Russia um, by a, a toxin subsequently identified, as my honourable friend has said, as Novichok which was the same toxin that was used in the attempted murder of Sergei Skripal in Salisbury in 2018. Uh, given the uh, use of the same toxin in such sim similar circumstances, does my honourable friend not agree uh, that it is overwhelmingly likely that agents of the Russian state were responsible for the attempted murder of Navalny in 2020? Uh, that uh, any protest current protestations by the Russian state that it is not responsible for his death last week are entirely risible, and what action is the government taking to ensure that those who are responsible are brought to book and tried before a court? Well, the right honourable gentleman is, is correct. Uh, that's why we do demand a full and a transparent investigation, because those individuals involved must be held to account. Uh, Sammy Wilson. Madam Speaker, the whole House should be worried about developments such as we have seen at the weekend with the, the murder of Navalny, because this Russian state, now run by a bunch of criminals, seems arrogant enough to assassinate opposition people outside its own boundaries, invade nations, threaten other nations, and now, of course, su uh, suppress democracy in its own country. It is disappointing that the Minister has only come today saying that he will look at all the options. Can he come to this House very soon with a list 
of sanctions, additional sanctions that we can impose on this regime, and also with ideas as to how we can isolate them diplomatically. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I can confirm to him that as and when action is taken, we are working at pace at uh, working up uh, all options. We will keep this House informed, but uh, the work is underway at pace. I can give him that assurance. James Wilde. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In terms of sanctions, this appalling murder is not really about the prison guards. It is about who gave the order, and that can only be Putin. So does he agree that we need to intensify the sanctions against him personally, against his regime, and pursue all measures to hold him to account for this murder? Well, I, I do agree, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it is a matter of justice and international law, apart from anything else, the cogs of which turn slowly, but we should have confidence that they, they do turn. Dame Leah Griffiths. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, the gruesome treatment and appalling murder of Alexei Nalvi Navalny is a stark reminder, if ever we needed one, of the evils of Putin's regime. Now, time and time again, we have asked what progress the government is making to overcome the legal concerns in order to repurpose the frozen Russian assets to support the recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine, as other countries like Canada and Estonia are already doing. And yet again, we've had an empty response this afternoon. So could the Minister now really prioritise this issue and come back as soon as possible with a real plan of how we in the UK are going to use those assets and make sure that we can help Ukraine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Madam Speaker, we are working at this in pace. It is urgently important, and of course we will keep the House updated. Uh, Richard Drax. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It takes an extraordinary person to go back to a country where he knew he'd be imprisoned, tortured, and then murdered. And all our thoughts, I know, are with, are with Alexei Navalny's wife, and uh, our best wishes go to her. The best way to commemorate his tragic death is to ensure that Ukraine does not fall. Will my right hand friend ensure the House that he's doing straining every diplomatic sinew to ensure that our allies, both in NATO and the EU, give Ukraine what it needs to keep these Russian thugs at bay and to regain their country. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, Madam, I endorse entirely his comments about Mr Navalny's courage and also the sense of hope that he gave uh, people in Russia because of that courage. Uh, he asked about Ukraine. Of course, we seek to lead by example in terms of increasing our contribution with regards to lethal aid as well as humanitarian support. And I think our collective response in the NATO context also shows that if Putin thought he could walk into Ukraine and conquer the entire country, um, he, he was quite wrong. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Let's call this what it is. It is state-sponsored terror by Putin and his regime. We know that Putin and his regime attempted to murder uh, Navalny a way back two years ago, three years ago now, with Novichok, the same Novichok that was used against Sergei Skripal in the streets of the United Kingdom. But the difference with the response today and what we saw then from the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead, is that we took action immediately, not just us, but our allies in Europe and in North America, by expelling US diplomats. As my Honourable friend has already mentioned on the sanctions regime and the Majinsky sanctions, we need to act now. Putin needs to get the message that we will stand up to Russian terror. Why are Russia participating in the G20 summit this week? There needs to be a very clear message to Putin. The only message that he will understand is that we will take the swiftest action against this international thug. I agree with his sentiment. We are acting. Sanctions have deprived Putin of billions of uh, dollars of revenue to fund his war machine. And I, we would never, of course, comment prematurely from the dispatch box about future sanctions, uh, but we will continue to do everything we can to ensure that he is deprived of the ability to wage his uh, illegal and evil war. Carrie Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I would strongly support what people have said about the need for the Minister to come back in perhaps a week's time to tell us more about what action can be taken. But can I ask him about what he said about working with the opposition to Putin? 
um, because I know when I went out with um, the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, it was some years ago now, but it's actually incredibly depressing how little support we were trying to find allies that we could work with. We just simply couldn't amongst organised political parties. I also went out for the Pussy Riot trial, felt you know the, the strength of feeling there, but clearly they're not people that we would work with on that sort of level. So what can we do? navalny has gone, Nemtsov has gone. Who can we work with to try to support people who are opposed to Putin? The Honourable Lady is right, and she makes a good point. Um, the tyrannical regime of Putin leaves absolutely no civic or political space for any kind of uh, freedom of expression or political engagement, no matter how moderate. What we can do is ensure that Russian people have more access to the truth and to better information. And that's why a lot of our energy goes into working against Russian disinformation uh, right across the region. Alistair Carmichael. Thank you, Speaker of the House, and I think the whole country is easily and instinctively united in their condemnation of this latest evidence of Vladimir Putin's brutality. But is the Minister not just a little bit uncomfortable that he makes his statement on the same day that his colleagues in the Home Office have announced restrictions on visa access for those from Ukraine fleeing the war against Russia? Does he not understand that we diminish the effect of our outrage unless we are seen to be doing absolutely everything at home and abroad to support our Ukrainian allies? Yeah. Yeah. Speaker, I know from my own constituency, and I think all members will know, that our collective response, whether it be, whether it be from the government or at local government level or indeed individual level, has been consistently generous and open-hearted. Uh, Debbie Abrahams. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I just wanted to, to take the opportunity to, um, to put on the record and express my condolences to uh, Alexei Navalny's friends, family, and to the Russian people uh, as a whole. I mean, th what has happened uh, to Navalny is uh, an indictment on any freedom-loving um, people, which I believe the majority of Russians are. Um, my colleagues have said about coming back um, to the House, and I hope the Minister will, will hear that, because we are very, very keen to, to understand the effectiveness um, of, uh, of these sanctions. Um, because currently Putin seems to, to, to be standing with an impunity and doing what he wants with impunity. I think the, 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 the documentary uh, on Navalny uh, was very powerful and in the, one of his last statements it was, you know, it only takes good people to do nothing uh, for people like Putin to survive. We must make sure that doesn't happen. I'm grateful to Lord Lane, and she put her finger on a very good point, which is that Navalny essentially gave people hope, and that's why his message will resonate. That's why, despite his murder, he leaves a very, very powerful legacy, which I think will uh, continue to inspire the Russian people. Uh, Steve Ferry. Uh, thank you. The, the murder of Alexei Navalny reminds us of the, the scale of the threat uh, from Russia, not least to Ukraine, with, of course, the second anniversary of Russian invasion. Uh, this week. Following up on the, on the question in terms of the Ukraine family scheme, how can this possibly be justified in this context, uh, or indeed at, at all, uh, given the ongoing threat to Ukrainian families? This announcement was sneaked out today. It comes into immediate effect uh, this afternoon. So how can we justify this, particularly given that there are Ukrainian families who want to be reunified with, with relatives back in the UK? Yeah, yeah. Madam Speaker, I think he will know that actually he should address that specific question uh, to the Home Office. He, he mentioned the second anniversary of the illegal invasion of Ukraine and actually earlier today I had a very good meeting with the Ukrainian Charge d'Affaires at which we looked at images of uh, the Ukrainian Red Cross. Uh, delivering aid in some of the worst afflicted uh, cities uh, of Ukraine and each member in this house will choose how to remember and commemorate the second anniversary but I'm grateful for him raising it. Uh, Andrew Bridgen. Thank you Madam Deputy Speaker. I'd like to express my condolences to the friends and family of Alexei Navalny but can the Minister explain why we can have a statement in this house on the untimely death 
of one foreign national, but we can't have a statement on the ongoing excess deaths of 100,000 of our own citizens, um, many of whom have, have died suddenly. Is it because this death fits the government's narrative, but the death of our own citizens doesn't? Or is it a parody of Stalin, where one death is a tragedy, but 100,000 deaths is just merely a statistic? Well, I think the Honourable Gentleman has answered his own question. Madam Deputy, can I thank the Minister very much for, for his answers. Uh, and, uh, my, my thoughts are also with the, the, the family, the, the wife and the children and the friends of Alexei Navalny at this difficult time. What, one thing that uh, uh, some citizens in Northern Ireland can resonate with is the fear of the disappeared and how there are so many families who have not been able to lay their loved ones to rest. That is very apparent in the news story today, where the mother is trying to, to uh, uh, make access or get access to her son. Does the Minister agree that all efforts must be made to ensure Navalny's body is returned to the family so that they can understand a full investigation and can lay their loved one to rest? Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman is right. He is absolutely right in what he says. That is why our Ambassador has made that representation directly to the Russian Government today. They must release Mr Navalny's body uh, back to the family, and we will keep making those representations until that takes place. I thank the Minister for his statement. And we now come to, as, as personnel change, Sitting there. Now come to, to statement, Minister Chris Philp. With permission, Madam Deputy Speaker, I will make a statement on anti Semitism in the United Kingdom. Last week, the Community Security Trust published its latest report on anti Semitic incidents. It made for deeply disturbing reading. It showed there were 4,103 instances on, of anti-Jewish racist hatred recorded across the UK in 2023. That is the highest annual total ever reported to the Community Security Trust. It is a 147 per cent rise from the 1,662 anti-Semitic incidents the previous year and 81 per cent higher than the previous yearly record of 2,261 incidents reported in 2021. Most shockingly, over two-thirds of the incidents reported last year occurred on or after October the 7th, when Hamas perpetrated its barbaric terrorist attack on Israel. The report also indicates that anti-Semitism began spiking before Israel's military response had begun. The week immediately following October the 7th saw 416 anti-Semitic incidents reported to the CST, higher than any subsequent week. Madam Deputy Speaker, the CST's findings, which tally with increases in offending reported by the police, are nothing short of a disgrace and an outrage. Examples highlighted in the report are shocking and reprehensible. I urge all members to read the report because it shines a light on the scale and character of this disgraceful problem. The only reasonable conclusion to draw is that members of Britain's Jewish community are suffering a level of hatred and abuse which is frankly shameful. There is no excuse for the behaviour outlined in the CST report or seen in some of the shocking incidents that have occurred recently. The situation in the Middle East does not and will never give anyone the right to harass or intimidate others. I repeat, Madam Deputy Speaker, no one ever has that right. This government will not stand for anti-Semitism of any kind. It is important to note the police have comprehensive powers to deal with abhorrent conduct of this nature. For example, in the case of public order offences, where there is proof of racial or religious hostility on the part of the offender, Offenders will be charged with racially or religiously aggravated versions of those offences, which will result in an uplift being added to their sentence. Furthermore, inciting racial hatred is an offence under the Public Order Act 1986, and anyone engaged in that appalling behaviour should expect to be arrested. Whenever and wherever criminality involving anti-Semitism occurs, 
This Government expects the police to fully investigate the incident and work with the Crown Prosecution Service to bring the perpetrators to justice. Mr. Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have been clear both before and since the October 7th attacks that we will do whatever it takes to keep Britain's Jewish community safe. We have taken strong steps to confront the poison of anti-Semitism head on. We have increased funding to bolster security at Jewish schools, synagogues and other sites. This means a total of £36 million will be made available for these crucial protective measures across 2023 24 and the following financial year. The Community Security Trust is an essential partner in our efforts to keep the Jewish community safe, and I pay tribute to them and the brilliant work they do. The Home Office meet regularly with them, and we cooperate closely with the CST. We keep a constant dialogue open, and I can tell the House that both the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister have regular meetings with them. But of course it should sadden us that these kind of precautions are necessary in the UK in 2024. But the work of organisations like the CST is more important than ever, and we must remain vigilant. That includes sending the message from this House, I hope across the whole House, loud and clear that any instance of criminal behaviour will be identified and those responsible caught and punished. We are working closely with the police to ensure offending, including hate crime, and expressions of force for terrorist organisations are met with the full force of the law. The idea that anyone could celebrate or valorise Hamas for the appalling atrocities, the terrorist atrocities they perpetrated on October the 7th is beyond comprehension. It goes completely against the values of this country. Last month, we prescribed Hizb ut Tahrir, an organisation that actively promotes and encourages terrorism and is responsible for spreading anti Semitism. Hamas itself, of course, is already a prescribed organisation. Anyone who belongs to, or invites, or expresses support for a proscribed organisation is themselves committing offence. The penalties upon conviction are a maximum term of 14 years in prison and or an unlimited fine. The right to protest, of course, is a fundamental part of our democracy, but that right cannot be exercised in a way which intimidates others or in invokes fear in them. It is totally unacceptable where a small minority incite hatred and commit crimes. The police have powers to deal with that, and we expect them to act. Where further powers are needed, we will not hesitate to act, which is why we recently announced a new package of measures to crack down on dangerous disorder, in particular that committed at protests. Madam Deputy Speaker, the CST's findings on incidents within the sphere of higher education were especially disturbing. No one should be a subject to anti-Semitic abuse while at university. Every effort must be taken to prevent hatred flourishing in schools, universities and colleges, and that is why we announced a further £7 million of funding to help tackle anti-Semitism in education. Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to be clear we are equally unwavering in our stance towards hatred and abuse directed at British Muslims. The Government has been in regular contact with representatives of the Muslim community, and we are aware of an increased number of reports of anti-Muslim hatred as well. That is, of course, un unacceptable, and we have made additional funding available for protective security measures at mosques and Muslim faith schools. Madam Deputy Speaker, last month we marked Holocaust Memorial Day. Just as we remember the horrors of the past, we must remain alert to present-day dangers. Anti-Semitism is an ancient hatred, which has reared its ugly head in the most abhorrent and evil ways throughout history. The CST's findings show that we have much, much more to do if we are to rid our society of this poison. But this Government will never stop trying. We will never give up on this fight. It matters too much. And, of course, that extends to ensuring Members of Parliament are protected from acts of similar hatred, uh, which some Members have suffered. I'm thinking particularly um, of the Member for Finchley and Golders Green in the Chamber, whose office suffered a terrible arson attack just a few weeks ago. To the anti-Semites, we say this. You will not win. You will be shown up for the despicable racists you are. And to our Jewish friends and colleagues, I say this. We stand with you, we understand your fears, and we share your pain. We will protect you today, tomorrow, and always. I commend this statement to the House. Yeah.
uh, Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I welcome the Minister's statement and advance sight of it? The appalling and intolerable rise in anti Semitism that we have seen in Britain in recent months, set out in the report of the Community Security Trust last week is a stain on our society. We must never relent in our work to root it out, something I know the whole House will want to affirm. Over 4,000 incidents in 2023 alone are an urgent reminder of the responsibility on all of us to stamp out the scourge of anti-Semitism wherever it's found, and I want to join with the Minister in thanking the CST for the remarkable and tireless work they do each day alongside the police to keep our Jewish communities safe. Having supported and worked with them over very many years, I know the incredible forensic work they do on monitoring anti-Semitism, but also the physical protection that they provide for Jewish schools, synagogues and other community events. We owe them our thanks. So we welcome and support the Government's commitment of additional funding for the CST. The incidents that they report include a violent abusive attack on a Jewish man on his way home from synagogue, the desecration of Jewish cemeteries, a 200% increase in anti-Semitic incidents at universities, and just 10 days ago, we saw a Jewish student residence in Leeds, the Hillel House, vandalised with anti-Semitic graffiti. For the years that they are studying, universities are students' homes. No one should ever feel unsafe in their home, but wherever they are, everybody has a right to live in freedom from fear. And the CST's report also found the number of online incidents of anti-Semitism rising by 257%, an ancient hatred being resuscitated through modern means to proliferate and to promote extremism. And I agree with the Minister that it is unconscionable that one of the steepest surges in anti-Semitism came in the week following Hamas's barbaric terrorist attack on Israel on October the 7th, the deadliest day for Jews since the Holocaust, with individuals in this country celebrating those scenes of unimaginable horror. There must be zero tolerance for the glorification of prescribed terrorist yeah. groups yeah. on Britain's yeah. streets. Yeah. We support the prescribing of Hizbut Tahrir and also ensuring that anti-Semitic hate crimes always f face the full force of the law. Madam Deputy Speaker, in the weeks following the 7th of October, I met with CST and Tell Mama together, Tell Mama who monitor Islamophobia and who have also identified a huge increase in Islamophobic incidents and hate. And they were united in their call for an end to hatred and prejudice, an end to anti-Semitism, an end to Islamophobia. And we must never allow the terrible events and conflicts in the Middle East, which do cause deep distress across our communities, but we must never allow them to lead to increased tension, hatred, prejudice, abuse or crimes here in our communities at home. And so I welcome the points the Minister made about ensuring where there are uh, extremist incidents on marches, that those are also addressed with the full force of the law. But can I press him to go further in a few key areas? Firstly, the countering extremism strategy is now eight years out of date. Uh, there are reports that the work has been delayed again. Can the Minister tell us when the Government will come forward with an updated strategy? The Metropolitan Police Commissioner, the government's own experts, have warned there is a gap in the law around hateful extremism, which is allowing toxic anti-Semitic views and conspiracy theories to be spread and making it harder to police them. I have asked this of ministers before. Can he update us on what action is being taken? Will the government also look at, urgently again at the decision that ministers took around a year ago to downgrade the reporting for non-crime hate incidents, particularly around Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, to ensure that those who engage in vile and vitriolic religious hatred can always be properly monitored and identified by the police? 
And I ask him finally particularly about online anti-Semitism, which has risen. We've seen, for example, a huge increase on X, formerly Twitter, at the same time as there's been seen a downgrading in some of their monitoring and standards. Mm. Has the government raised this directly with Elon Musk and X? And can I urge them to do so and to set out how the online harms bill will address this? Because there are real concerns that this will not go far enough to address these changes. We stand ready to work with the government on this. I think all sides of the House will want us to stand together with Jewish communities across the country in solidarity against hatred, against prejudice, against anti-Semitism in all its forms. All of us must stand together and say anti-Semitism must never have any place in the United Kingdom. Minister. Well, I thank the Shadow Home Secretary for her comments and her questions. Uh, she asked about protests. I completely agree that where people uh, seek to intimidate others, where they seek to incite racial hatred, where they seek to um, glorify terrorism, uh, that is completely unacceptable. In fact, it is illegal. Uh, the police have made 600 arrests at pro protests since October the 7th, and we in government uh, are urging the police to use all of their powers to make sure uh, hatred is not incited in the course of the marches that have happened. Uh, she asked about online safety. Quite rightly, it's where a great deal of hatred is fermented. Uh, we are engaging with online platforms on a very, very regular basis. In fact, I think the Home Secretary is due to travel to California uh, next week to discuss these issues, amongst others. Uh, but the Online Safety Act uh, contains, I think, in, from memory, in Schedule 7, a list of priority offences. And I think uh, inciting hatred is one of those priority offences. And in relation to those priority offences, large social media platforms will, when that section of the Act comes into force, be under an obligation to uh, take proactive steps, not, not retrospective uh, steps after the event, but proactive steps in advance to prevent priority offences taking place, and that will include hate crime of the kind that she mentioned. Uh, she asked about non-crime hate incidents. Um, so that is, those changes to the guidance were designed to make sure um, that sort of very minor spats between neighbours or expressions of essentially legitimate political views do not end up uh, wasting police time by getting recorded. Uh, things that don't meet the criminal threshold, where they might be useful in pursuing a criminal investigation later, will still be recorded. And to be clear, um, inciting racial hatred uh, is a criminal offence under, I think, section 17 and 18 of the Public Order Act 1986, uh, causing harassment, alarm and distress through threatening and abusive language, uh, or causing uh, fear of violence uh, is an offence under sections 4, 4A and 5 of the Public Order Act 1986, and there are, thank you, and there are various other criminal offences as well. So uh, those, meet, those things meet the criminal threshold and therefore make are not affected by any change um, to non-crime hate incident recording rules in any event. In relation to updating the law and the extremism approach to extremism, um, that is something that is under continual uh, review. My uh, right honourable friend, the Deluxe Secretary in particular, I know uh, spends a great deal of time and is spending time uh, considering the question of extremism. In relation to criminal law, uh, we announced various changes just a week or two ago that we intend to legislate for via government amendments to the Criminal Justice Bill when it comes back to the House for report stage in a few weeks' time. And those measures will tighten up a number of areas relating to protest, including removing the reasonable and lawful excuse defence to various public order uh, offences, uh, making it easier for the police to have a blanket prohibition on face coverings, which are often menacing, but also make it difficult to identify people committing criminal offences at protests, uh, making it offen an offence uh, to climb on key war memorials, which is grossly uh, disrespectful, and, and other measures um, as well. Uh, we keep it under continual review, so if there are further changes to the law, um, the Right Honourable Lady can be assured we will make them. It is this Government's view um, that anti-Semitism is a scourge that must be fought online, it must be fought on the streets, through the law and through the courts, and I'm sure this whole House will be united in that fight. Suella Bratherman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my Right Honourable Friend for his hard work and genuine commitment to seriously tackling this issue, and I was pleased to work with him last year with CST. But the reality, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that the Jewish community has been demonised and targeted, is scared and has been let down by the authorities. The Jewish community needs its champions and friends to speak 
in its defence without fear or favour. Lord Ian Austin, who sits in the other place, is one such courageous advocate who has campaigned for decades against anti-Semitism and Islamism. Does my right honourable friend share my deep concern about organisations like Midland Heart, which has suspended Lord Ian Austin as its chair, merely for his speaking against Islamism, against terrorism and against anti-Semitism? Well, firstly, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, let me pay tribute to the work uh, of the, my right honourable friend, uh, the member for Fareham. Um, during her time as Home Secretary, we worked closely together, and I can tell the House uh, the Jewish community has no uh, stronger advocate or had no stronger advocate in, in government um, than she was uh, on these issues, particularly um, during the events of the autumn. In relation to uh, Lord Austin, uh, I do agree with what she said. I've read the tweets that he sent, and it strikes me there is. Uh, nothing unreasonable about them. He was criticising uh, Islamism, which is a form of extremism. That is not the same as the Muslim community more widely, obviously, as everybody knows. And I don't think uh, that the uh, actions proposed by Midland Heart are in the slightest bit reasonable. And I join my right honourable friend, uh, the DLUC secretary, in urging Midland Heart to urgently uh, reconsider what they have done. Lord Austin is a tireless campaigner against racism. Uh, was a great servant of this House when he was here and does not deserve the treatment that he has recently received. SNP spokesperson Ronnie Cowan. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for, for sight of his statement. Uh, the sharp rate in anti rise in anti Semitism and Islamophobia in the UK is extremely concerning, and the SNP extends our heartfelt sympathies to victims of anti Semitism and all forms of hate crime. But regarding this statement here today, I see you written bold funding to bolster security caught and punished to full force of the law, a maximum of 14 years, an unlimited fine, none of which I disagree with in any way, shape or form. We need to implement the law and we need to implement it robustly. But I'm a little bit concerned there's only one line in the statement which talks about education, and that says £7 million pounds in education. I'd like to say through education, because surely through education we can eradicate anti-Semitism. Through incarceration it becomes a lot harder. Part of Scotland's strength is our diversity. We value Scotland's Jewish communities and other diverse faith and belief communities. We recognise the important role that they play in making Scotland a safer, stronger and more inclusive society where everyone can live in peace and work to realise their potential. In June 2017, the Scottish Government formally adopted the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance IHRA, definition of anti-Semitism. Formally adopting the IHRA definition of demonstrates the Scottish Government's determination that there should be no place in Scotland for any form of anti Semitism or religious hatred that makes our communities feel insecure or threatened in their daily lives. The Scottish Government's recently published Hate Crime Strategy sets out its strategic priorities for tackling hate crimes, including anti Semitism. It was informed by the communities with lived experiences of hate crime and makes a number of commitments, including ensuring improved support for victims, improving data and evidence, and developing effective approaches to preventing hate crime. If we've got one ask, Minister, it would be that we reconsider how much money we're putting into educating people so that we can all eradicate this heinous crime. Minister. Well, the Honourable Gentleman asked about education, and I did make clear in my earlier remarks um, that in the autumn statement on November the 22nd, the Government did announce a further £7 million of funding to help tackle anti-Semitism in education and support, ensure supports in place for schools and colleges. Um, in addition to that, on November the 5th, since he asked about education, on November the 5th, the Department of Education uh, did announce a five-point plan to protect students, Jewish students, on university campuses, uh, which included a call for visas to be withdrawn from international students who incite racial hatred, uh, asking vice-chancellors to act decisively against staff and students involved in anti-Semitism, meeting the Office for Students, uh, the independent regulator, uh, to find out what more it can do, uh, to make clear that where there is anti-Semitism and racial hatred incited on campuses, that should be referred um, to the police, and to explore an anti-Semitism charter in higher education. So I do accept the point that education is important, education at school and at universities, um, but that is something where the DfE, the Department of Education, uh, in relation to England, is taking a lot of action. And I would certainly urge the devolved administrations in Wales and Scotland to do the same. Sir Michael Ellis. 
just campaigns of anti-Semitism are occurring in many universities in this country, and some Jewish students have visited me to tell me about it, uh, and it is bone-chilling, some of these accounts. The failure of the Metropolitan Police to deal with some of the fascist-style racists in the London marches has been a historic disgrace that has unleashed more attacks. The aggressive hounding by protesters of MPs, especially Labour MPs out campaigning, and a Conservative colleague at his home is a real threat to the democratic process. But my concern to the Minister is this now. Um, reports of a Magistrates Court judge liking yeah. an anti-Semitic post on social media, having passed an extremely lenient sentence on protesters convicted of terrorism offences. This judge apparently trains other junior members of the judiciary and is involved in judicial appointments of other judges. Shouldn't that result in a full, deep investigation with a past docket of cases being checked for bias and potential suspension pending the interim report? Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. I think Ministers are very clear that where on marches behaviour crosses the criminal threshold, inciting racial hatred, uh, causing a fear of harass harassment, alarm and distress, to give a couple of examples, terrorism offences, glorifying uh, prescribed organisations, we do expect the police to take robust action. We do expect the police to make arrests. They've made about 600 arrests so far. In fact, some police officers, some brave police officers, uh, were injured in the course of trying to make an arrest in London uh, just on Saturday. In relation to his point about members of parliament, I would echo and strongly endorse the point that he made. No member of parliament, democratically elected representatives of the people, should be subject to harassment or intimidation. We've seen, as he said, some Labour um, MPs receiving that. It's completely unacceptable. Uh, we've seen the incident at the office of my honourable friend, the member for Finchley and Golders Green, completely unacceptable. I believe in that case some arrests have been uh, made. And, of course, my honourable friend, uh, the member for Bournemouth um, East, uh, who uh, suffered a terrible incident at his home address just a few days ago. All of that is unacceptable. All of that is illegal. And I expect the police to not only protect MPs, but identify and arrest the culprits afterwards. Now, in relation to the judge, the judiciary are, of course, independent, and matters of judicial conduct are subject to investigation by the Judicial Conduct Investigation Office. And from the account of the incident that I've heard and that I've heard my right honourable friend give, uh, this is the kind of thing I would expect the JCIO to be investigating. Chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee, Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, as the Minister knows, the Home Affairs Select Committee has been carrying out an inquiry into the policing of protests, and we've been particularly appalled to hear evidence of the huge increase in incidents of anti-Semitism perpetuated in the wake of the 7th of October terrorist attacks. And the CST um, recorded anti-Semitism incidents last year, 43% explicitly referenced the Israel-Palestine October the 7th attacks um, and the conflict in Gaza. So we know that uh, attacks on Jewish and Muslim communities here in Britain in response to overseas conflicts are never acceptable. And I wondered if the Minister could say something about what more could be done to stop the exploitation of these overseas uh, conflicts and the effect it has on our community cohesions and communities in this country. Minister. Well, I think the Chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee asks a very good question. Um, it does deeply disturb me personally, I'm sure it disturbs many members, to see conflicts that are occurring elsewhere in the world played out on our own streets and leading to, to put it politely, tension, but a lot, a lot more than tension, often hatred being incited domestically. As I said, there is no excuse whatsoever for the events in the Middle East, in uh, Gaza, uh, to lead to anti-Semitic hatred on the streets of the United Kingdom. It's completely unacceptable. Uh, and I'm disturbed to see people engaging in that kind of behaviour. I think what we need to do as political leaders across the House is to make clear to our own communities that that behaviour is not acceptable, that it is not consistent with British values, and that the laws we have will be very rigorously and robustly enforced. We have values here of, of tolerance, of mutual respect. Uh, we obviously abhor terrorism, we abhor violence, we abhor intimidation. And I'm sure I speak for the whole House when I say we don't want to see that 
anywhere on our streets, and no one, no matter how strongly they feel about what's happening in Gaza, should be uh, behaving in a way that is intimidating or that incites racial hatred. I think if all of us across this House speak unanimously with one voice on that topic, it will be heard by all communities in this country. Andrew Percy. Mr. Speaker, I think when British Jews woke up on October the 7th to the pogroms and the associated rapes, butchery of children and hostage taking, what we expected was sympathy from people on the streets of Britain. Instead, what we've seen is people attacked for speaking Hebrew, we've seen Jewish businesses attacked, we've seen Jews assaulted, and then we've seen hate marches on our streets. As we saw again this weekend where the fella holding the sign reminding those marchers that uh, Hamas, a terrorist organisation, is the one who was dragged off uh, and had his collar felt by the police, whilst uh, uh, people are continuing to march through um, the streets with cries for jihad, intifadas, and in support of the Houthis. So it's all fine what everybody's saying in this place, but the reality of the situation is the demonisation of the world's only Jewish state is playing out in the demonisation of Jews in this country. The embedding of anti-Zionism, which in and of itself in many cases is pure Jew hate in our universities, is being wrought on Jewish students. So it's fine to have the measures that have been outlined, but there is a deeper problem in our society here. Jews do not feel safe in this country, and more must be done to tackle the real root cause of Jew hate. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Well, look, I, mean, I, I was as, as appalled as my honourable friend when the reaction from some people, a small minority but nonetheless deeply disturbing, to what happened on October the 7th was jubilation. I mean, that is, that is uh, sick, it is unacceptable. Uh, depending on how it's expressed, it's frankly also illegal because uh, encouraging acts of terrorism uh, is a, uh, or acts by a prescribed organisation, which Hamas is, uh, is obviously a criminal offence. Uh, as I said already, there is no excuse whatsoever for that kind of behaviour. And I was as sickened as he was, as sickened I'm sure as the whole House was, to see that some people, some of our fellow citizens, reacted apparently with jubilation instead of with horror and sympathy uh, to what happened on October the 7th. Look, in relation to the police response, as I say, 600 arrests have been made uh, at the various protests that have followed October the 7th. Uh, we have met with police repeatedly. I've lost count of the number of meetings we've had uh, with the police in the last three or four months uh, to urge them to use the full extent of the law and to show zero tolerance uh, to people who break the law and who incite racial hatred. And, you know, as I say, 600 arrests have been made. In relation to individual incidents, there is sometimes more to these than meets the eye, but I will be asking for an account uh, of the incident that he just referred to. But he's absolutely right to say that no member of the Jewish community on the streets of central London, at universities, at school, should suffer fear and intimidation. The truth is that, particularly in the last few months, they have suffered fear and intimidation. That is unacceptable. We, will, we expect the police to use the full force of the law to stop it, and I know this House will speak with one voice in unreservedly condemning it. Therese Villiers. Will the Minister agree that the attack on my constituency neighbour's office in Finchley and Golders Green was utterly unacceptable? Yeah, it's an attack yeah, yeah. on democracy, yeah, yeah. and it is a great matter of sadness that this Parliament will use a lose a fantastic MP because of intimidation associated with his being prepared to stand up for his Jewish constituents and stand up for Israel. Yeah. Well, I, th I thank my honourable friend for that question. Um, I mean, I'm pleased to report to the House that um, arrests have been made in relation to the appalling attack on my honourable friend, the member for Finchley and Golders Green's office, and I understand that the perpetrators are currently uh, on remand in prison. Um, but it is a tragedy that uh, someone with the exemplary track record of public service, my honourable friend, the member for Finchley and Golders Green, uh, feels that he is unable to stand again for Parliament, partly as a result of the intimidation that he suffered, in particular the arson attack, on his office. Uh, he has been, as I'm sure members across the House will acknowledge, a fearless advocate on behalf of his many Jewish constituents. Uh, it will be a loss to them and a loss to Parliament uh, following the next election, which he won't be uh, contesting. And I think it is incumbent on all of us to make sure um, that no other members end up feeling that way, because I don't want to live in a country, I'm sure none of us want to live in a country where democratically elected 
representatives feel any form of fear or intimidation. That is not how democracy works. In this country, we settle matters at the ballot box, not through intimidation uh, tactics or violence on the streets. And that is a principle each and every one of us must, to our last breath, defend. Uh, I do apologise. I took two members from this side, so I'll now take two members from the other side. Dame Margaret Hodge. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Can I firstly welcome the very strong statements being made by the Minister and the strong statements being made by the Shadow Home Secretary? And can I say that I really do hope that uh, in tackling this deep-seated anti-Semitism, which, uh, which the Honourable Member referred to, that we can work in a united way across the House and not seek to make cheap political points on, on any individual uh, cases. Um, can, we've had attacks on Jews in theatres in London. We've had attacks on Jews, as other Honourable Members have said, in campuses, particularly in Leeds and Birmingham. And we have had, as the Honourable Member of Northampton North said, a judge failing to penalise three people for glorifying terrorism in London. So people are worried across all sorts of sectors, across all sorts of locations, and in all sorts of areas across our country, that, uh, that anti sanctions and spreading. I just wonder, the government's response to this needs to be coordinated. And I wonder if the minister can say when a new hate crime action plan will be published, given that the last one, despite consultation on the interim, was published some five years ago. Minister. Well, I share the Right Honourable Lady's horror at the various events highlighted in the Community Security Trust's report. Uh, incidents like at the theatre where uh, a Jewish man was essentially hounded out, a disgraceful and despicable act which has no place in a civilised society like ours. She mentioned the case um, that the Right Honourable Gentleman, the uh, Member for Northampton North, the former Attorney General, raised. And I spoke to the current Attorney General earlier today, and I understand the Crown Prosecution Service are reviewing that case as well, um, because uh, it deeply concerns me, as I know it concerns her as well. In relation to uh, a strategy, um, that is something I know that the uh, community Secretary, in relation to extremism, the Community Secretary um, continues uh, to consider. But the approach the Government has taken is one of action rather than words. The legislating via the Online Safety Act, for example, which, as I've said to the Shadow Home Secretary a few minutes ago, contains some very strong measures. And she and I, when I was Technology Minister, uh, discussed at some length um, the measures in that bill needed to uh, combat hate, based, in fact, on some of her own um, terrible experiences that, that she suffered of anti-Semitism. I've talked about the increased funding for the Community uh, Security Trust. I've talked about the Department of Education's plan in universities and schools, the extra money for the Holocaust Memorial Trust. So the government is, is taking action rather than simply uh, expending more words. Um, but I know this is something the Community Secretary uh, is extremely alive to. Minera Wilson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Sadly, we've seen a trebling of anti-Semitic incidents on university campuses between 2022 and 2023. The CST recorded 67 incidents on university campuses in the month following the horrendous attacks of 7th of October, compared to just 12 in the same period the previous year. And we've heard from other honourable and right honourable members about the terrible reports coming out of Leeds and Birmingham universities earlier this month of anti-Semitic graffiti and harassment of Jewish students, which is why I and my Liberal Democrat colleagues very much welcomed the £7 million that the Minister has alluded to that the Government announced in November to tackle anti-Semitism in schools and universities. But since then, we've had no update on how many applications have been made to that fund and how that money has been allocated. So could the Minister confirm to members when we'll get an update on some of the many actions he's outlined today, and in particular that how that £7 million has been allocated so far? Minister. Um, well, I'd be very happy to come back to the, the Honourable Lady and other members uh, with an update uh, on, that, on that question. Uh, obviously, it's an evolving situation, um, but, I, but I echo her comments. It is particularly concerning when universities, the training ground for the next generation, appear to have been uh, hijacked by anti-Semites in some places, where Jewish students are being intimidated and harassed, uh, where Jewish societies have their meetings 
um, you know, uh, picketed and where uh, people stand outside uh, shouting abuse and worse. That is completely unacceptable. And you know, I, I think all of us, again, should support the Department of Education's uh, work on this and call on university vice-chancellors to show absolutely zero tolerance for this kind of behaviour and to stamp on it hard wherever they find it. Andrew Jones. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I thank my right honourable friend for his statement and join him in paying tribute to the work of the Community Safety Trust. But today, however, the most senior Liberal Democrat councillor in Harrogate and Nairsborough has been exposed for tweeting horrendous anti-Semitic comments for the past five weeks. She had hundreds of followers, including many senior local Liberal Democrats. She tweeted over 500 times on the subject, and the tweets were read over 10,000 times. So it beggars belief that no Liberal Democrat knew what she was saying. They must have known. But in the five weeks that she's been tweeting, they did nothing until it was exposed to the media today. So in our politics, we've seen anti-Semitism in meetings, we've seen it online, we've seen it in Rochdale, and now we've seen it in Harrogate. So does my right honourable friend agree with me that the political leaders need everyone in every political party must act immediately if they encounter anti-Semitism in their midst and not wait to see if anyone notices? Yes. Well, my honourable friend is, is quite right, of course. It is particularly incumbent on political leaders, from whom many other members of the community take their lead, to act not just when it gets exposed in the media or when pressure builds, but to act immediately, not because it's convenient, but because it's right. And I think uh, whether it's the example that he gave in Harrogate or indeed the recent example in Rochdale, acting immediately from principle is what counts, not just reacting to public pressure a few days later. Christine Wake. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Jewish people in my Greater Manchester constituency have had to endure a 163% increase in anti-Semitic hate crime, as detailed in CSD's annual incidents report. Some of that is blatant, targeting Jews. Others is much more sinister, targeting Zionists. And when we see a banner saying Zionists not welcome, we know what it means. Yeah. Jews not welcome. Let's call it out for what it is. Anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Jewish community in my Berry South constituency have benefited from the government's additional £3 million to increase the already extensive security <laughs> provisions. And again, I thank the government for doing so. But will the government be prepared to continue this temporary funding? And given the extensive threats to the Jewish community, consider making it permanent. Minister. Um, well, I completely agree with uh, what the Honourable Gentleman just said. Uh, very often, anti Zionism is nothing more than anti Jewish sentiment. It is anti Semitism. We should call it out where it happens, as he just did, and he was quite right to do so. In relation to the extra money for the Community Security Trust, um, that will apply this current financial year, so that will be a £3, three million pound increase to £18 million pounds in total. It will apply next year as well, so the financial year 24 25, and will be kept under review thereafter. Uh, James Daly. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. And as one of the two members of Parliament for the Metropolitan Borough of Bury, can I support exactly what my colleague from Bury South said in respect of that? And I think it is important. We don't want to cheapen this debate, but how political parties deal with anti-Semitism within their ranks yeah. is crucial and sends an important signal to the country as to how this Parliament treats this issue. Therefore, does my right honourable friend share my disappointment, and it is disappointment and genuine disappointment, over the Labour leader, the right honourable member for Holborn and St Pancras, as weak, flip-flopping, change in position concerning the remarks by their now ex-candidate for the Rochdale by-election. And these are remarks described by Martin Ford Casey, who compiled a report for the Labour Party on bullying, sexism and racism within their ranks as clearly anti-Semitic. Yeah. Well, I think, as I said in response to the Honourable Member for Harrogate and Nesborough a few minutes ago, it is incumbent on political leaders, particularly those who aspire to the highest office in the land, to act quickly and from principle. And I am disappointed that it took a number of days after the comments of Labour's former Rochdale candidate uh, became public for the Leader of the Opposition to act. I would suggest that he reflects soberly on that. Uh, I'm sure I'm disappointed that it took so long. I'm sure, on reflection, he's probably disappointed with himself as well, and it might be uh, useful if he said so publicly. Debbie Abrams. Thank you, Madam Deputy, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I, I think the, the figures from the CST are absolutely horrific. Um, Anti-Semitism is absolutely unacceptable. Hate crime 
including Islamophobia, absolutely unacceptable. But can I ask the minister, does he think that there is sufficient capacity and, uh, within the police to be able to investigate the, the full range uh, of, of issues being raised? And also, what's the role of the AHRC in actually preventing the discrimination that can contribute to this hate? Minister. Well, I think there is enough resource in policing. We've got, uh, as I may have said once or twice before, uh, record police officer numbers, 149,500 or so reached in March of last year. So we do have sufficient resources. The police are prioritising this, uh, and they can, of course, work with the EHRC uh, to take action, criminal action, where the EHRC identifies uh, examples of anti-Semitism. Julian Lewis. Following the battle of Cable Street against Mosley's black shirts, the 1936 Public Order Act introduced measures that restricted severely the ability of Nazi-type movements to march in predominantly Jewish areas. Uh, is the minister satisfied that the police of today are sufficiently aware of the powers that they have to stop marches taking routes that go through the areas that are predominantly associated with a threatened community? Minister, um, yes, I am, and the police do it. For example, on Saturday, there was a convoy planned from the north of England uh, to North London, uh, many parts of which obviously have Jewish communities, and the police stopped that convoy because they were concerned uh, that it would inflame uh, tensions and that the convoy was going to uh, engage in uh, intimidatory behaviour. The police also have powers under sections 12 and 14 of the Public Order Act 1986 to place conditions on both processions and assemblies where they feel it will lead to disorder. And in fact, they do use those conditions. In fact, they use them um, at the weekend when the marchers originally planned to go right up to the Israeli embassy in Kensington, but conditions were imposed uh, to prevent them getting uh, in undue proximity uh, to the embassy. Uh, and in fact, the member for Kensington sitting next to me on the bench uh, made direct representations to the police on behalf of her constituents, raising concerns about that. So yes, the police do have those powers, and they used them uh, more than once as recently as this weekend. Barry Gardner. Thank you, sir. The Minister will be aware that the largest Jewish school in Europe is in my constituency, JFS. Uh, and I want to thank the CST for their vigilance and service on behalf of all the students and their families. Now, sadly, only last month a student was physically attacked by a group of youths outside of the school. Those youths goaded the student about the situation in Palestine. So would the Minister agree that nothing can justify such an attack on an innocent school child? And does he accept that whatever one believes about the actions of the Israeli government, racism and anti-Jewish hatred must not be allowed to hide behind any political mask? Minister. Well, the Honourable Gentleman is quite right. The events in Gaza, or indeed anywhere else in the world, provide no basis or reason or excuse at all to inflict racist abuse on citizens in this country. There is no justification whatsoever for anti-Semitic attacks on Jewish people in this country uh, because of what is happening elsewhere in the world. And what happened to that boy outside the Jewish free school, JFS, in his constituency, and what has happened, sadly, tragically, to thousands of uh, members of the Jewish community in recent months is totally unacceptable. It is totally without excuse, and uh, the police should act to make arrests where that happens. Dr Matthew Offord. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I pay tribute to the Community Security Trust, who are actually based in the Hendon constituency, for the work that they do, not only the full time staff, but also the volunteers? But sadly, the amount of offences that we have seen does not surprise me. The uh, continued pr uh, protests that we see on the streets of London is simply normalising anti Semitism in the United Kingdom. But what bothers me the most is university campuses. More and more of my constituents are telling me that their children will not be going to university as a result of that. 245 universities have adopted the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, but others continue to refuse to do so. Does the Minister agree with me? There's no logical reason why any Vice-Chancellor would not do so. Minister. Well, well I, I join my honourable friend, the member for Hendon, in paying tribute to the work the Community Security Trust does. Uh, to Mark Gardner, its chief executive, and to all of its staff, volunteers, and those people who fundraise for the CST. It does 
work that has, I think, never been more important than it is now. Uh, I agree with what he said about universities. I think I can see no reason at all why every vice-chancellor, why every university should not adopt the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, and I call on them today to do so. Uh, there is no excuse whatsoever for failing uh, to act, and I endorse and echo the five-point plan set out by the Department for Education uh, to get this issue on campuses tackled. It is deeply disturbing, and I want to see vice-chancellors uh, and other university leaders do a lot more to stamp out the scourge of anti-Semitism that is all too present on our country's campuses. Charlotte, please. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. This weekend, my heart broke seeing some 20 officers and multiple police vans stationed outside my synagogue and that this was deemed necessary for our protection. The conflict in the Middle East is being used to radicalise people against British Jews online, in our schools and universities, and on our streets. Additional security funding is welcome, as is the funding for education settings, but what financial support and resource will be provided to local authorities for projects working across our faith and community settings at a local grassroots level to bring communities together rather than allowing them to be driven further apart? Well, she's right to say that, that grassroots work is needed. The £7 million I referred to earlier uh, is, is part of that, uh, and, and organisations like the CST, which obviously the government substantially fund, uh, will provide quite a lot of money to, £18 million a year, uh, do work in this area, good work in this area uh, as well. Uh, but I echo her sentiment and that of others. Uh, there is no excuse, there is no reason, there is no possible justification for targeting Jewish people in this country, and the full force of the law must come down on anyone who does that. Chris Clarkson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I can't have been the only one the weekend before last to have watched with a mixture of horror and incredulity as uh, several Labour front benches were sent out to justify retaining their Rochdale candidate. Only for 48 hours later, their leader to reverse his position based on comments at a meeting and then praise himself for his decisive action. Then they had to suspend their candidate behind, uh, behind them for the comments at the same meeting. If the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition, is serious about having changed his party, as he repeatedly claims, does my Right Honourable Friend agree with me that he should publish a full list of the attendees of that meeting, a full transcript of what was said by who, so that voters in the North West can know who they're voting for and what they actually believe? Minister. Well, my honourable friend is quite right, and I agree with what he said. Uh, the Labour leader, the opposition leader, should publish a full list of who was at that meeting and a full transcript to show that he is serious about tackling anti-Semitism, and I call on him now uh, to do that. Uh, he should have reacted much sooner. It shouldn't have taken 48 hours to suspend a candidate who had said, obviously, anti-Semitic things. Uh, I'm deeply disappointed uh, by that unexcusable 48-hour delay, but he now has a chance to make at least partial amends by publishing that list and publishing that transcript. Christine Jarling. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I welcome the comments today from the government in clamping down on this astonishing and worrying spike we have seen in anti-Semitic incidents since October the 7th. Anti-Semitism is vile. Yeah, yeah. It's disgusting and it infects every area of society, including, sadly, politics. And where we see it, we need to root it out and remove people from the process. To that end, I have written to the Right Honourable Member for Saffron Walden, asking if we can have a cross-party discussion on how we deal with the problem in politics, because we can't pretend that it doesn't exist. It does. I wrote to her in November and I wrote to her again last week. So can the Minister please take forward that suggestion and see if she will convene a cross-party discussion on the issue? Minister. Um, well, of course, there are many uh, APPGs and other cross-party groups taking an active interest in this area, uh, and of course, I'm sure the Home Affairs Select Committee will consider it um, as well. But I would be—I think I'm going to see uh, the Honourable Member for Saffron Walden at some point later on this evening, so I will happily uh, remind her about the Honourable Lady's letter. Steve Crabb. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank the Minister for coming to the House and giving this very important statement this afternoon. Does he agree with me that even more alarming than the sheer number of anti-Semitic incidents being reported now on a daily basis is the way that there is this kind of creeping tolerance across so much of our national life, so many of our institutions, and the universities are just one example of this, tolerance of a kind of 
acceptable level of anti-Semitism, so long as it's dressed up in a bit of Israel hatred. Does he agree with me that that is what we need to be focusing on tackling? Uh, because at the moment, as the CST report demonstrates, we are moving in a very, very serious and dark direction as a country. Minister. Yes, I agree completely with what my right honourable friend just said. We do need to show zero tolerance to uh, all forms of anti-Semitism. And I think it's incumbent on everybody, actually, in, particularly members of Parliament, but actually everyone in civil society, university vice-chancellors, teachers, lecturers, everybody, yeah, people in the workplace, every single member of our society um, has an obligation, I think, to call out anti-Semitism when they see it, indeed any racism when they see it, um, because unless people are willing to do that, there is this danger that it creeps, as the right honourable gentleman just said. And I think it starts with members of parliament doing that in our own constituency, constituencies and doing it publicly. That is what zero tolerance means. It means never turning a blind eye. It means never turning the other cheek. It means never crossing the road and passing by on the other side. It means always calling out anti-Semitism and racism wherever we see it. And that, I think, is an extremely important message. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As, been said, as has already been said, the CST report includes those shocking figures about the rise in anti-Semitism uh, in university settings, and the Union of Jewish Students has warned repeatedly um, about a climate of fear for Jewish students on campus, and of course incidents in recent weeks will only have deepened that fear. Can the Minister say a little more about what he and his government colleagues will do working with our universities to ensure that Jewish students can feel safe and secure during their time studying with us? Minister. Well, I think as we've discussed already, uh, members across the House are particularly concerned about what is happening in, on university campuses. And as I said previously a couple of times, um, the Department for Education uh, has a five-point plan, which they set out just a few weeks ago, uh, which includes withdrawing visas from international students who incite racial hatred. And by the way, I think anyone who is not a British citizen who incites racial hatred um, or commits criminal offences in this area um, should be removed from the United Kingdom. People who come to this country need to respect our laws and respect our citizens and their rights and their dignity, and people who are not British citizens should be removed, uh, either under the 1971 Immigration Act or under Section 32 of the Borders Act 2007, if they incite racial hatred. And I know my colleague, the Immigration Minister, will take action there. We want Vice-Chancellors to do more. We've written to them asking them to do more. Uh, we've had meetings with the Office for Students, the regulator, to make sure they are doing more to clean up what is happening on campuses. We're doing more to make sure criminal referrals get made from universities to the police where anti-Semitism happens. And as I've said already, I think, and the DfE thinks, every single university should sign up to the IRHA definition of anti-Semitism as well. Jonathan Ginobili. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Does my right honourable friend know that synagogues in the West End of London are being specifically targeted uh, by these so-called protesters, um, and that not only is this happening once, twice, but on now multiple occasions, to the extent that they're even looking to see what time the services finish, so that old people, the young, parents, so forth, are being terrorised. This isn't supporting Palestine. This is anti-Semitism. This is attacking Jewish people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I hope that he'll call in the Commissioner and sort it out. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister. Well, my honourable friend uh, it is quite right to raise this issue. Um, gathering outside a synagogue with the purpose of intimidating uh, people coming out of the synagogue is completely unacceptable. That is not protest. It is deliberate intimidation. It has no place on our streets whatsoever. The police have substantial powers uh, to act in this area. I'm not going to recite all the, all the various um, sections and acts, um, but there are numerous powers the police have to act. Uh, and in one of our regular meetings we have with policing leaders, I think there's actually one we've got coming up in just a few days' time, I will most certainly be raising this. Um, if the Honourable Member for Huntingdon uh, could just send me a couple of examples, I would be very happy to raise those with the Metropolitan Police in the coming days. James Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister very much for, for his statement, for his robust answers, uh, and for his strength of purpose to support Jewish people across the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland? Very clearly, the Minister is doing that. W will the Minister outline if discussion has taken place with the devolved administrations, in particular the Northern Ireland Assembly, regarding a support fund for those who feel unsafe in their current homes and need help to move to a safe place? 
bearing in mind uh, the fact that we are now in a scenario where Jewish families are staying indoors, afraid to go out unless it is absolutely essential, due to so-called peace protesters who are making our streets feel unsafe for a sector of our community. Thank you. Minister. Uh, well, there is nothing peaceful about deliberately intimidating Jewish people going to synagogues, as we discussed just a moment uh, ago, and I'd be happy to look into the question of funding available for devolved administrations to do work in this area. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The shocking rise in anti-Semitic attacks reported by the CST is bad enough. The trouble is that was last year, and the escalation has continued into this year. And those people in London suffer the hate marches literally every Saturday with banned organisations displaying their flags, placards which are clearly anti-Semitic, vile slogans uttered, and then after those so-called uh, protests, peaceful protests disperse, they go and intimidate people in the restaurants, bars and theatres throughout London. So much so now that my Jewish constituents are afraid to go into central London on a Saturday.